Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about media and virtual production. And our second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. And today, we're going to be talking about uh, cables, <laughs> lots of cables, how we build cables, how we look at them, uh, the process of uh, of how we pick them and how we use them and connect them, et cetera. So if you've got questions about cables and cabling, go ahead and cable management, go ahead and throw those in for the second hour. Uh, and if you have general questions, you can throw them in the first hour, either in Makana, or you can go to askofficehours.com. Um, and uh, and you can or just use this little QR code here. So um, go ahead and uh, throw those questions in, and then we'll feed them in for the show. Let's go ahead and jump into the first question. Bill, what do we have? Our first question this morning comes to us from Sean Johnson in New York City. Um, streaming to YouTube via client's account very often gets a yellow high bitrate warning in the dashboard. Using YouTube's suggested settings in OBS, it's stressful to see these in a live stream. How concerned should we be and how can we fix it? Thanks. Jeffrey? So what that is, is uh, that's a buffer setting. So basically it's saying that the uh, buffer is getting to a point where uh, it's it's trying to send it to YouTube from there. But there is the, there's a little bit more than expected inside the buffer. When it starts to hit red, I think that's when you really need to be concerned. Hitting yellow is something that you don't want to have happen, but it does happen. Some ways to check that is to check the how you have your connection from the computer to the to the internet. Maybe an Ethernet cable. Maybe check that out. Test your in, uh, your internet. Uh, make sure you don't have anything else running. Uh, turn off any, you know, if the kids are watching 4K Netflix or something like that, you might want to turn that off if you've got a lower end bandwidth uh, for upload. And then uh, go from there, you'll be fine. But you're using the right settings. That's the most important thing. And it, sometimes it just becomes unstable and you get those yellow lights. A good guy. Uh, in addition to that, to, to give you some comfort, what you do is just test, 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 you know, get familiar with what the reaction of that uh, indicator is telling you. And what I always do is send a second stream via RTMPB so you can have a primary and a backup stream. So if you feel that uh, you're getting into that danger zone, uh, just have a secondary computer that can swap it out in case something does happen. Ideally, down to two separate pipes. So you have one internet that is maybe Comcast or whatever your local provider is and a backup, even if it has to be cellular. And uh, ideally, a separate computer with a separate power path as well. And that gives you comfort in live streaming, making sure you're not going to go down. Jesse? Also, not to give you too much comfort, but some broadcast tools use dynamic data send depending on the complexity of what data it's sending. So if you're broadcasting from an ATEM and you switch to a still image, YouTube will absolutely panic because it thinks the bandwidth has dropped off, but actually the ATEM is just sending a lot less signal because it doesn't need to send as much signal. So check if your broadcast tools are using uh, dynamic data sends during broadcast. Yeah, the um, I, it, I, I haven't quite got my, my finger on this because we've sent as much as 35 megs a second, you know, to, to YouTube without any warnings at all. So it, you know, it is a curious thing for OBS to do that. We, we've been sending them from appliance encoders, um, but um, without any, any errors. And so um, I'm not entirely clear, but we'll do some more research on this. Next question. Next one comes to us again from Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida. Thoughts on the IVI Zoom Cam monitor light displayed at Zoomtopia? In my humble opinion, I find the monitor way too small to be useful to me. I need a 17-inch at least. Hard to see other content or slides when presenting, and he's got a link there. Go ahead, Guy. I agree. You definitely want a second display in addition to the 10-inch that's on there. And to give you an idea of how big 10-inch is, we have the official banana for scale. Tape measure. <laughs> Seven and a half inch banana. banana. So how big is your head? The Ivy has a 10 inch screen. So that should answer that question. So what we do is we, we put the person that's talking active speaker on the display. So you're looking at them straight down the barrel and then secondary contents on, on, a, on a larger display. So for those who didn't see it, you can jump over to the website. So please put a link. It's myivy.com. And you can take a look. It's just a teleprompter with a camera behind it. And it's all integrated all in one. But yeah. Take a look at it. Go, Jeffrey. Yeah, uh, this is definitely made for something that you would set on top of a desktop uh, and have only a couple feet away like I have right now in, in this situation. And uh, if you're starting to move it farther than three feet away, you're definitely going to have some problems with many different things. 
Uh, and I'm not exactly sure the brightness of the uh, of the monitor just yet. Uh, I know that it's got the start of a sensor at 4K, which is a really nice sensor to have, camera sensor to have inside. Uh, but when you start going farther back with uh, with cameras like that, you, you run into, like I said, more problems than just being able to see the monitor itself. Next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next. He says, an article about the latest Blackmagic camera update mentions orientation locking being useful, quote, when the iPhone is on a boom or jib. How would you attach an iPhone to one and remotely control it? Good, Bill. Just in terms of the attachment, most of us use something like this. This is the small rig cage for the phone and the advantage of it, I'll just scroll up here. You can see that it's a complete surround. You buy the model for your phone. It's precision built just for that. But along the left side here, as you're looking at it, you'll see a variety of quarter 20s. Those aren't the only ones, but there are quarter 20 ports in there. And if you're rigging the phone to something where you want stability, um, having those kind of attachment points make it far easier than it would otherwise be. There's more than just this version of that, but putting the phone in some kind of a holder that it gives you solid attachment points are really pretty much mission critical if you're doing a lot of end of a jib kind of work. Jason? Uh, yeah, similar thing. I mean, this is more for handheld, but if you're going to be handing it into a jib, unbroken shot style, um, having handles and uh, quarter 20s on the top and bottom are uh, pretty handy. Thanks, guy. Yeah, good guy. Yeah, I was just going to say the same thing, a little one like this, but I would probably say that um, the Blackmagic camera app's the wrong uh, tool for the job at this point. Filmic Pro is still a value where it has the ability to remote control it from uh, another device. So until uh, Blackmagic comes out with that, um, um, go to Filmic Pro if you want control of the camera and exposure and things like that. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think that for the most part, a lot of times with these kind of jibs, if you're using your phone, uh, typically you're just doing a, a, an establishing shot. You know, I'm doing it if you're doing your phone. You could probably do a little bit because you can't really pan and tilt it. I mean, you could probably put it on some kind of uh, DJI head or, or something like that. But but you're not going to be able to, I mean, I think that if you were using a jib for most of those things, um, but I do think that it's going to get out of the way. So I think that guy's absolutely right. Filmic Pro is going to be easier to to use as far as getting those angles exactly where you want. Um, but I can't imagine putting it, I, I wouldn't put a phone on a jib very often. Uh, go ahead, Bill. So one other thing I use for controlling it occasionally, there are watch apps that attach via Bluetooth to your camera, depending on the software you're running. And I know I can go into standard record, not using any other software on my phone. Uh, the record app on my watch will actually give me start, stop, and it'll actually even give me a view on my watch. I use that a lot with my monopod, holding the monopod at the bottom so that I can watch on my watch as I set up the shot and then hit start or record. So there's some kind of nice little tools. That's not the world's most absolutely dependable system. And sometimes if you're in a really crowded area, I find some little Bluetooth anomalies. But generally speaking, I've had good success with using that system for just run and gun put a camera way up on the top of a monopod and be able to see the shot and execute it. Good, Courtney. I, I don't have the app or an iPhone to try it out on, but if it, any of you that have it tried uh, plugging in via USB the HDMI out and plugging into a HDMI touchscreen to see if it handles the, if you could put out a non-clean output out of the HDMI output, see if you could use the controls on the touch external touch screen to control what's going on in the camera. One of the things I think it'll be interesting to see is if 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 uh, Blackmagic eventually ties the ATEM switchers into the into the cameras. You know, they're just because we can control an ATEM. Uh, you know, over with all the IP stuff that, that's actually happening, you could theoretically have it's already talking in that realm. It could theoretically talk to the camera. So it'll be interesting to see how long that takes to come out. I think it's seems like a really obvious thing for black magic to do uh, next question mitchell ball michael ball excuse me in san francisco california has anyone tried the orion ipad app the devs behind Halide just released an app which works with generic hdmi capture devices seems awesome for free but will it uh, but we'll be interested to know what's compatible what would you monitor with your ipads go ahead jason 
Um, I, I didn't care what I was going to monitor. The minute this came up, I, I bought and then just arrived um, this little, their suggested capture card and gave them the five bucks because I think conceptually it's just awesome. And um, so, yeah, I, I don't actually know yet because I've been too busy. I'm sorry. Ask next week. Sorry, we got a question jumped a little too quickly. I couldn't, okay, yeah. Yeah, I think it's gonna be really cool. And we talked about this on Mac Break a little bit. Um, there's also one, Video Assist, I think is the one that Guy Guy had talked about, which I downloaded because Guy did it. Yeah, go ahead, Guy, I think we got the question back. Yeah, they, they raised the price on it. I was testing it with, when it was in beta and uh, it was 79 bucks. So one of the things that we use it for is you, you could record uh, as well as see things like scopes and it, so you can do waveform and exposure and things like that. The thing that I like um, that I already had beforehand to do this was the Axoon CMO. It's a hardware device that allows you to do the same thing, but I believe that the bandwidth of of the Axoon CMO is higher than um, just regular UVC. So I'm going to run some tests to see if that is still true because then it's worth the uh, hundred hundred something bucks that I spent on Axoon CMO and the app on Axoon CMO. It, I think it's better than the Video Assist app just because they have. Uh, more history and a lot more user base at the moment. But yeah, take a look in the app store at the Video Assist app. And uh, I mean, monitoring your camera while you're shooting. If, you, if you've got a, a camera up on a boom or a jib and you want, you already, you already have like you have the 12.9 inch with USB-C, this is a great monitor, you know, it's an awesome monitor and I already have it. And so is the iPad mini and so is your iPhone if you have the 15. It's especially, I was using the Action SEMA with the red, um, the little, um, what do you call it? the red Komodo out in the field and that was amazing. So it, it, the iPhone can be a nice monitor if you don't want to spend some money on a small HD or something like that. Well, and also, I mean, it's one thing, it, it can be a monitor and it can also, it's a processor in there. So it could stream, it can, um, you could analyze things, mark things up. You could, I could, you know, they're not there yet, yet, but now that we're, we're just at the very beginning of, oh, we can put video into the, into the uh, monitor. So there's a lot of things that I think are now possible with the iPad that we haven't seen before. And we have, I think we're just getting started, <laughs> you know, in, in these apps are, and hopefully these apps and our job is to look at them, play with them and give them feedback on it. I, I'm, I'm surprised that no one's really, it's interesting that the video scopes folks are spending a lot of time on video scopes, but won't spend much time on audio scopes and the audio scopes, you know, folks don't talk much with the video scopes and it just feels like somebody someday it's going to bring them all together. <laughs> you know, like, and so we all have, we just have one place that we could go with all the scopes that we needed. Um, but no one's done that yet. We'll see if it happens. Next question. Bill Mew in Tunbridge Wells, UK, seeing a big move to SRT. New Black Magics are now offering it. New VMix 27 has it and is increasing the output channels to four. And the new Magewell Director Mini has SRT in and out. Does this count as a trend yet? Good guy. Yeah, absolutely. It's It's been out for a long time. A lot of us have been using it, the High Vision Makito. So High Vision uh, started SRT and then they, they started the SRT Alliance, which allows anybody to go ahead and use it for free. So uh, we've been using hardware encoders as well as software. And you can do SRT really easily. I did a workshop in, in, in our lab in After Hours once where I let a bunch of people just use the Larix app in the um, in the group and we sent a feed up to an AWS instance. And I, what I did was I made a nine up Brady Bunch style um, vMix uh, multi-view so everybody could see their feeds as they came up. And for those that didn't want to spend any money, we just used um, OBS. So you can use OBS to stream SRT. It's really exciting to see Blackmagic getting on board with uh, putting it in their, um, their new encoder. And I have the beta to YouTube for SRT. So uh, I haven't been able to get that to work. It appears that there's two betas because uh, the default setting that they have inside of the web presenter right now does does not does not work. So I have to get on the secondary beta to get it to work. But anyways, uh, it's exciting just because, uh, and I'm hoping I was talking to Oliver down at uh, Zoomtopia. I said, dude, you got to get SRT in. I know it's, I know it's one of those things. But now that he can run that in the cloud, it's exciting to be able to take SRT feeds in. So you can have three cameras with SRT encoders, send them up, have a sporting event. The question now is. How do you get them in sync? So one of the tricks that we've been doing is sending it up SRT as 4K and then in, a, in a, a quad view. And so they arrive all at the same time and then we extract those back out and they're perfectly, they're, it's completely frame accurate if you send four HDs in one 4K and that way you don't have to worry about time code. Otherwise you're going to have this SRT shifting of time codes. And SRT um, mini server has some tools if you do go that route to be able to convert SRT to, mini, to NDI and align that time code. 
Yeah, one of the things that we do um, for, for some of that is to use a 3G to 12G conversion to 12G, and on the other side, a 12G to 3G. And that way we don't have to, you know, the quads all just get quadded up and then unquadded on the other side. And, you know, and that, that works with almost anything that's out there. I mean, any type of transport um, is, is that way you're not trying to figure those things out. You just have a, a little box that just push, pushes them all into one thing and then another box that splits them all back out to HD. Uh, to HD. Next question. Matt Halverson in Brookings, South Dakota. What's the best way to handle feedback on a microphone in a football stadium? When the umpire begins talking, the audio immediately feeds back and only gets worse the longer he talks. The only speakers are located to his left side. Noise gate, maybe? Jason? This is probably, okay, the best way to fix this is to fix the speaker and the, the mic placement. But barring that... Um, this is going to be a really fast solution. This is the Behringer Feedback Destroyer. What it is is a really, really quick parametric filter that uh, will go right before your PA, and it will just notch out and, and wreck feedback in real time. It claims 0.2 seconds. Uh, I've used these. They're not great, but, but they do work. Good, Bill. Uh, I will just tell you, the, part of it is the feedback and eliminating that. Part of it is the skill of the person talking, in this case, the referee. I, I have done some stadium announcing. It is one of the most difficult jobs I ever held down for a while because typically – when you're speaking, the delay between you speaking in a large stadium kind of circumstance and all the reflections coming back off of remote speakers create a delay that can be as much as a second. And if you've ever heard yourself fed back into yourself with that kind of delay, it shuts down most people's brains. So I, I would do the best you can to to give your, your referee some sort of internal system. And when he or she is talking into the the stadium crowd, they hear as little as possible from the outside world and also is as close mic'd as possible so that it helps with what uh, Jason was just describing. But it's a tough thing. Uh, I'm just, uh, you know, I would work with your umpires, get them out there on the field when there's nobody in the crowd and just put them through this process because it's a little unnatural and it can be very disorienting. So just from experience. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, Jason's uh, suggestion would, would might eliminate the howling type feedback, you know, which is regenerative feedback with low latency. The problem you get into with the stadium is a lot of times it goes through something where there's a, a large degree of latency, so you're getting echo, like Bill said, and uh, getting rid of the repetitive, now, 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 ladies and gentlemen, men, you know, you'll hear that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, getting rid of that, you might try running it through some of those new RTX uh, uh, noise gates that are work with the uh, NVIDIA RTX boards, the broadcaster it's called, because uh, they can eliminate other sounds rather than specific frequencies. So it's an AI eliminator. You might try that. The other thing is to think about your microphone placement. As Bill said, if you can position a mic near their mouth with the cardioid element facing back at the mouth, that will help somewhat. Or if, uh, you know, I know uh, refs probably don't want to wear something that's tethered to their head, but uh, you could put it in their hat uh, facing back at them uh, as well. Uh, so that's another solution. And use a, a directional microphone, like a cardioid microphone lavalier, and point it back directly at their mouth. That'll help some. Yeah, I mean, in the cases that we've used this in the past, we have tried to persuade the reps to use a headset mic because it definitely makes a big difference. Getting that, that getting the microphone a lot closer to the source is going to mean that it's going to pick up a lot of other, lot less of other things. Um, in in the next step from that is a Sure WL one eighty five. This is a it looks like a little. Um, pill. It's pretty big, and it's a, but it's a cardioid. There's a 184, which is a super cardioid, and the problem with it is if they, if they pull their shirt, it'll turn a little bit, and you won't be able to hear anything. Um, so so the, uh, the super cardioid usually we found to be a little too much, so the 185 being the, the cardioid, and you really do have to get it pointed directly. So if they get, if they get it kind of turned one way or the other, it, it can be a little bit problematic, but those things, they have a, um, a hinge on them, the 185, so you can kind of turn them once they get there to, to make that actually work. So that's going to take some of it down. Obviously, ringing out the room, so you know, notching the EQ and a parametric EQ, and trying to find where that re that reflex is, is is something that we do in every event. <laughs> I'd like to go through and see every room and every location kind of has a natural um, ring to it, and you try to get through that ring um, to make that actually happen. 
obviously having the speakers if you're in a pa system if you're not in a if you're in a stadium oftentimes the things are all pointing towards you anyway but if you're in a place where you have a pa system you know the it's the, the plane of the you know the thing that we pay a lot of attention to is the plane of the of the speaker so if the person's standing here if there's any way we can get the speakers out in front of where that person's sitting that's going to greatly reduce the the amount of feedback that you might get so those are some things to think about there uh, just a quick reminder of course that you can ask questions throughout the hour uh, to go ahead and throw those into makana vote on those questions so we know what order you'd like us to add um, ask them in and or you can use this little qr code here or just type in askofficehours.com and throw those in and then we'll mix those into the rest of the questions coming in let's go to the next question Ian Alford in London, England. I have a Sony A7 III full-frame camera. Can you help me understand what I gain if I switch to the FX30? Obviously, sensor size and body shape are different. What else? Is 10-bit worth the change? Uh, for your information, I make short documentary films. Good. J Jesse? So the good news is if you've got 2000 for a Sony camera body, you're not going to get a bad camera body. Everything in their lineup is pretty, pretty solid. Uh, there's a difference that goes beyond sensor size when you're comparing the FX30 to the a7 III, and that's uh, p uh, pixel density on that uh, sensor. So the FX30 is a smaller sensor, but it's a higher megapixel count, and this means that this, the actual pixels will be smaller. Each, each individual pixel is smaller, and that means that it'll soak up a little bit less light than the a7 III. So in theory, in theory, the FX30 should perform a little less well than the a7 III in low light scenarios, but that's in theory. There's um, a lot of a lot of tricks going on under the hood with uh, with image correction these days. Um, and the other thing is between 10-bit and 8-bit audio, 10 bits better is would I make the jump just for 10-bit? I don't know. I would prefer a correctly exposed and correctly color balanced image in 8-bit to an incorrectly exposed or color balanced image in 10-bit. The, um, uh, I would say that the, your next upgrade from an A7 III uh, is probably an FX6. So, uh, you know, that's going to give you the form, a more of a video form factor. Um, I don't know if I would, I don't think an FX30, I think that that would be going sideways or backwards, you know, from, from where you're at right now. Uh, so the form factor isn't dramatically different. I mean, it's a little bit different there. Um, you have a couple more recording options, and that might be something you want to look at there. But I, I think that for documentary work, I mean, the, the one that I would be looking at is that I've either the FX3 or the FX6. The FX3 still has kind of a different form. The FX6 is the first one where you start getting the box form factor that you may want to use. And of course, it's got, you know, it's got a great sensor on it. So those, those would be the things that I'd start to look at. But otherwise, I don't know if I would necessarily up, you know, or side grade from the 7.3 to the, um, to the, to the uh, FX30. And I have an FX30. And I've used a lot of um, A7 S3s. <laughs> three, yeah, go ahead, Jesse. I, I would keep them both and have one be the A camera and one be the B camera if this is just a straight out purchase. Yeah, I mean, I think that the issue is, is that the, 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 the problem is, is I, you know, I would say that when you're using zoom lenses, at first I was like, oh, I, I, Super 35 is okay. But I think I, th I said Super 35 is okay because that's what I had a lot of. Uh, the, the full frame sensor allows you to stop down just a little bit um, and it gives you a greater greater range of lenses while still getting a lot of control over your depth of field. So um, I wouldn't, uh, you know, I use Super 35 right now for this, um, but, you know, I'm looking really closely for my web camera at, you know, testing the LR1, which is this new Sony that's basically the size of a webcam with the the uh with a full frame sensor <laughs> so so that's and i think that um and, and this has been mostly dealing with how much do i want to blur out especially when i'm when you're doing interviews and documentaries the the, the challenge is you don't have a lot of choices in your spaces a lot of times unless you got a lot of budget so if you have if you have a lot of budget we would know because you're shooting your documentary in an airy <laughs> so 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 the uh uh but if you um, are in something smaller a lot of times we don't have as much choice and so getting, having a lot of control over our depth of field so we can knock that background out as much as possible um, is, uh, is really useful. And so, you know, I definitely, if shooting a documentary at this point would go with this full frame sensor. So I have control over that, especially through zoom lenses where I can stay in their sharpest point, which is usually between about four and six and a half. Um, next question. Paul Wallace and from Austin, Texas, on the PC side of things, would you rather build your own computer or buy one ready to go like an HP Acer and so forth? Uh, Jeffrey? 
Buying uh, buying a self built or a, a built computer from uh, the large companies is great because then you just get it there. You, you have if you have problems, you send it back. They they send you a new one. But the one thing that a lot of these cases do is they do a lot of modification. So if you're looking to expand from the case, maybe put in some uh, some video cards or put in uh, some capture cards or, or anything like that, you might start running into problems in finding space to do that because maybe they put in a side card or anything like that. Otherwise, uh, they also have deals with some of these chips that they put in for video, for audio and all that. And so you have to end up dealing with what they have for OEMs in there, as opposed to something like an ASUS board, which does have the same chips, but with the fact that it's just a general size uh, case uh, insert, then that could that needs to fit into almost any case that goes in that you have, then you you can uh, you can do a lot of more customization. But it's really your comfort level when it comes to building cases. How comfortable are you? To building the case and you just want somebody else to deal with it go ahead jason oh um to me it's not an either or um each has its own purpose i built a, a monster computer on on an air force base last week and i remembered how much fun they are to build like they 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 actually keep getting easier and um, that sounds crazy, but uh, you know the, the hardest thing of any build is is uh, you know how do you get exactly the right amount of thermal compound and uh, other than that they really the motherboards just everything fits where it goes and goes where it fits and it, it's not difficult uh, as far as production is concerned um, I gave up building production PCs a long time ago. Good, Courtney. Yeah, I used to build all of my own PCs uh, for years and years and years and uh, because I enjoyed doing it and I could customize it and put the stuff in it that I needed. These days, but for just a generic normal use PC, I buy off the shelf from Dell or HP because you're not going to beat the price. It used to be I could put together a computer cheaper than I could buy one of the top end uh, uh, off the shelf uh, manufactured PCs. But these days, you can't do that because they have the economy of scale. They're selling millions of these machines and uh, they're designing their own motherboards. <clears throat> so if you're buying, uh, you know, buying your own motherboard, buying your own hard drives, buying your own um, a case, et cetera, uh, it's going to end up being more expensive than buying uh, a machine that's put together by a manufacturer who has economy of scale. However, if you're into gaming and you want to, you know, max out everything, there's some manufacturers, Alienware, that, that uh, do game machines, top-end game machines, but you pay a pretty penny for that. And uh, you may not be able to customize it to exactly what you need as far as video card and, and all the uh, the amount of memory that you need, et cetera, and the motherboard that you, that you want to have in there to be expandable. Uh, these days, Dell, you got to worry about, as Jason said, a lot of times they'll do proprietary interconnects or motherboards, proprietary motherboards. So if you have a motherboard go bad, you won't be able to replace that motherboard unless you get a complete replacement from the manufacturer that matches that machine. Uh, if you build your own, you can always upgrade your motherboard later. That's something to consider. Uh, if you want to tinker and build your own and upgrade it over a period of years, I'd say build your own. If you want to go with it, use it till it becomes obsolete and buy a new one, go with the manufacturers. Good guy. Yeah, it depends on what you want to do with it. If it's a purpose-built machine, our, our guys at uh, Puget Systems here locally in the Seattle area, they have a whole brevy of just different uh, use cases where you have like 3D rendering or uh, specific for vmix or specific for photoshop work so these machines are tested if you look at their blog you'll see all these articles that they've written and these guys spend hours and hours so unless you want to go down that path and become an expert on all the latest and greatest uh, I'd, I'd say go hand off those duties to somebody who who has a passion for it uh, like on the vmix side there's acme who has like these nine ten thousand dollar computers and some of the guys in this group that i'm and have just had the same discussion where we're just like, yeah, let the, let these other guys build it. And other guys are like, no, I have the hundred hours to sit there and do the research and make sure I get the right thing and make sure that the um, there, there's certain software that can be installed. Pre um, like I bought a, um, a Dell uh, Alienware and it has some bloatware on there. And so if you buy an off the shelf system, that's the thing to watch out for. If you're turning that machine into a production machine, it can bite you. 
uh, when it does an auto update in the middle of your show. <laughs> so you just got to be careful. The guys at Puget Systems are who I would recommend to, if you're using it for production to go ahead and just give them a ring. Jason. Perfect segue guy. Uh, buy or build more importantly than the hardware. I will always, under every circumstance, the last 20 years, every computer I've pretty much ever touched and needed to rely on, completely strip down Windows, completely scrub it, completely reload it, and then um, use a series of scripts to just kind of get rid of all, all the junk that even a, or not even a proprietary build, that a Microsoft um, Windows comes with and and to this day like the augmented reality portal come on microsoft don't be aspirational with this with this windows next question next question comes to us from bill mew in turnbridge wells uk it has anyone had a look at the new magewell director mini arrival to the yolo boxes or seen a full review of it let yet it looks very promising i go jesse it looks like an interesting device. So it is a live switcher with some uh, streaming capabilities built in. You got your Ethernet out, your SD card. Um, it's uh, it's a product that is entering not a particularly dense marketplace, but one that is fairly well serviced already by Atomos and Yolo Box. So it's kind of, a, you know, good luck. Uh, the big problem, and this is what makes it untouchable, is uh, by me is. It's only got two HDMI ins, and I cannot, I, I can't fathom cutting anything with just two HDMI. Four is really constrictive. Eight is kind of the minimum we ever go out with, but two is, is it just ain't happening over here. Next question. Uh, looks like Keck Maori in Morris, Illinois. And the question is, following the, my question about NDI audio and mixers in a previous show, I see that the Mackie DLZ now has NDI. Is this just the beginning? What future do you see for NDI and mixing? And this is one of our questions that came in from the QR code. Um, so thanks uh, for p posting that there. Yeah, I think that I think we'll see more NDI in mixers. Uh, I think that there's this, this interesting thing that we saw a little bit discussed um, as we, um, uh, you know, when we had CalRec on earlier this week, is that we need more capabilities in the cloud, but we also need more IP capabilities that are just kind of IP only capabilities um, in the on prem as well. And so I think this is kind of a step towards that. So it'll be interesting to see where this goes. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, NDI has been proven time and time again that it can handle uh, building in a studio with uh, several cameras with several sources coming in. So doing that with audio is going to only accentuate that. And with Dante getting into AV uh, options that uh, NDI has to pretty much follow suit and make sure that their audio and their video side both can do the same functions. Uh, and I, I know that uh, when I get a board like this, I will definitely be using a lot of NDI uh, sources. And I can't wait to see some NDI microphones coming out that don't even need to be connected up to a computer. That'll be a real game changer. Next question. CJ Covell in Downington, Pennsylvania. Uh, other than cross-platform compatibility, what considerations exist when choosing a uh, APFS, Mac OS Extended, and or extended journals as a drive format for video and general computing. Jason. Okay, anything after uh, Mac OS 10.13 is natively using APFS. As far as extended and extended journal, I don't want to get into that. Um, but as a rule, as long as your machines are after 10.13, which they should be if you're using the use case you stated, then just use APFS as far as platform compatibility. Um, X fat or nothing. Yeah, I mean, I, I generally, if I think that I'm gonna, I'm gonna ever open the, I'm sorry, I think if I'm, if I'm gonna open it on a PC, I generally put an X fat, <laughs> like so, you know, so that that makes sure that things are gonna go back and forth. Um, so it just depends on. Uh, there are some occasionally some uh, limitations, but X fat works pretty well. Um, that and I think that that that's where I'd go if I thought I was putting it on another platform. Next question. Andre Dully in Berlin, what's the brand of the headphone extension cable with magnetic lock that panelists are using? Does it work with 3.5 millimeter headsets and loop the mic uh, as well? Yeah, I and this think is another that, QR question, by the way. Yeah, I think that this was um, the headphone disconnector, I think is the, is the um, go ahead, Jason. 
Yeah, um, angry audio is what you need to look at, um, and I think it's uh, Mitch usually has it. But yeah, it's it, look at angry audio, and you'll see what you need. Yeah, and this is uh, the, I don't think I think it only makes it for a headphone. So this is just a tip ring sleeve. Uh, so it's uh, you know so it's a TRS, not a TRRS, which would be two rings, which would give you the mic. Um, so um, I think that this is simply a uh, is just your stereo out from the. Uh, from the computer or from the, the headset jack. It's just a something you put in the middle to break if it needs to. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, I don't know if I'd want to have it break. I mean, I understand you, if you're if you got a wired headset and you, you get up and to go get a cup of coffee or something like that, you don't want that cable to get uh, stretched out. But uh, do you really want it to break and, and make a noise? I, whenever I had extension cables, I actually 3D printed a, a cool little thing that would screw together so the two ends would not pull. And yeah, I'd, 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 get the, I'd get the headphones yanking off my head, but I think that would be better than, than this, but I could be uh, wrong. We've, we've, got a couple, we've got some users that are in the group that are pretty happy with it. <laughs> I don't think it, it doesn't break easily. It just, but it snaps before it starts pulling at things. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I, I just use a regular uh, extension cable with a 3.5 to 3.5. And then if I pull on it, it does come apart, but it's not magnetically connected. Uh, and these are a dime a dozen, you know, on on Amazon. Next question. Next one comes to us from Dale DeMetta in Oakland, Oakland, California. I have two different Personas audio devices with the same issue. They show up in system preferences and or sound on a Mac. The mic works in settings, but neither work as mics in Zoom. Any solutions? Jason? Mm, this is a tough one. I worked in a recording studio two weeks ago and uh, the Presonus were just fine. We were going from a very old version of Mac OS to a very new one. So we really need to know the model and in your exact situation. But check, uh, check Presonus for a firmware update. Uh, um, sorry, next question. So I, was reading, so I was reading a question that came in from the drop because, you know, I'm, I'm still moving those in. It was just a, I might put it, bring it in. It was just a funny question. <laughs> All right, anyway, cool. go ahead, next question. Something to look forward to. Yeah. Uh, Douglas Carmichael's up next. The Madison Square Garden Sphere has been said to consume 28 megawatts at full operation. When managing a system at this scale, what would you use to make sure parts of the system are turned on and or off in the right order and to log alerts and alarms? Could Universe conceivably do it? Conceivably, Universe could do it, but there's some pretty complex systems that they have built into the sphere that are that are probably... Uh, you know, multi-million dollar um, systems that 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 may maintain how all of those things um, happen. Um, and there's a series, you know, a group of engineers, not just a person doing these things. So um, so while Universe might be able to do something like it, uh, the the, um, the power systems and the and the and the systems that are built into that into that system are intense. Um, it is is probably the most complex venue ever made, um, and it's uh, it looks. Looks pretty cool. <laughs> I'm looking forward to. I'm going to try to get out there to see uh, you two before they leave. Just to, you got to. I think you got to experience it, John. How how hard is it to get tickets? Is it a? Uh, uh, I don't know. On the general tickets, they're they're showing movies now in between the concerts. So oh really? Uh, yeah. I wonder what movies would look like in in the concerts. Some some you know specifically designed show. Right, right. right. Interesting. Yeah, because I. I'm just very curious. I, I'm more interested in just going there and seeing the screensavers. <laughs> you know, I saw some of the build up. I bet you, I bet you they have great screensavers uh, there to to look at. That I read a book. short article. I can't remember his name, but one of the famous directors who's working at the top of his game, they commissioned him and he built a set of kind of demo things specifically to show you what it can do. So it should be a pretty cool experience just going to the movie. Absolutely. Next question. Uh, Bill Mew in Turnbridge, Turnbridge Wells, excuse me, UK. Uh, cables, when using SDI, should we be getting R6, R58, R59, or what? Let's, let's, All of let's these are available. Let's hang on that one until the next hour because that, that's a, that's a, okay. uh, let's, uh, I'll put that one back. Push that. I think it just got mis, miscalculated there because we're talking about cables in the second hour. Let's go yeah. to the next question. We're going to Rion Smith in Trinidad in the West Indies. Hi, folks. I have to pitch a concept for creating a town's online TV station that probably will cover small business advertising, the mayor's office meetings, sitting events, uh, town auditorium events, and hall meetings. What process and gear would you begin with? Jesse? Um, I, I, it's a very broad question. 
So I'm going to skip over the process because all I can say on process is get the picture in and get the audio in and then either record it or broadcast it. But what I'd be thinking about is uh, cameras with SDI because SDI is much easier to scale than HDMI. I'd be planning for three cameras uh, so you have uh, different shots to cut between. And I would definitely be planning for a comm system so you can talk back to your camera operators while you're cutting a switchboard. And uh, audio solutions are... Uh, complicated and kind of eternal. The The question is so big that it's hard to recommend any one audio solution, but you'd want 24 channels, you'd want to have your mics, and I would want uh, all of the audio to be hardlined if you're building in a facility. There's a, a you know, a, a shiny new wireless mic system every week. Uh, we don't rely on any of them for uh, blocked off productions. So uh, definitely consider hard hardlining everything and good luck it's, it sounds like a very exciting project if you have more questions please come back with you know with more focused questions and we'll be able to give more specific i'll be able to give more specifics i hope you go bill yeah I, the first thing i do is just survey 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 what's there to, you know obviously if it's an existing municipality they have probably a city council chamber and that's going to have some uh audio reinforcement sound reinforcement for the meetings and things like that so you really do need to look very closely at what already exists and then come up with a integrated plan for taking what's generating signals already and moving that into this, quote, online TV station. So you're going to be stringing a lot of cable. You're going to be looking at things that they hadn't looked at before, which is not just lighting for the eye, but lighting for cameras, how to make people look decent, how to, you know, figure out, do you have six city council people or 12 um, and all those little things. And when it comes to online advertising and things like that, once you get the standard, the, the city, the municipality can communicate with the residents effectively, then adding those kind of things becomes just a little separate thing to do production, to feed into the system. But I would concentrate on that, that survey of the in equipment that exists now and have a strategy for adapting that into a video production kind of environment. Good, Courtney. And I would uh, try and fit it all into a 6RU Gator case of some sort so you could make it portable. Because on a small town, you may want to, you know, those different places may not be in the same building, mayor's office, town meetings, town hall meetings. You may have to move it to different areas rather than try and run long cables even within the building. It may be easier just to put it on a cart with a, uh, you know, six rack unit uh, case and move it around to wherever location you're going to use it in. So. That's a that's a consideration in building it out. If you make it portable from the beginning, it'll be easier when it comes time to move it around. Yeah, good guy. Yeah, I would take a look at what other counties have done and see if there's something where you can get an idea of what you want to do and either rough it from your your own uh, ability to see what the gear is, or I would look at hiring an integrator to at least get you in the ballpark. There's many popular ones like AVI systems. They are probably one of the biggest in the nation. They have uh, they have offices across uh, in every major city. Um, the other thing I would do is Google search for the, the approved budgets, and you can see of, of certain cities you could find the entire detail breakdown because it's public information. So it'll, it'll show you what mixer, what microphone, and that podium, what, what displays, what, every little cable. If it was Crestron, there's, and then be be aware that those integrations are super 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 pricey. So somebody like AVI is going to charge you about three, four, five times the amount that you. If you did it yourself, if you had the know-how uh, for them to spec it, but that's their job, but you'd get the right thing that works and you don't have to do the research. Um, I would, yeah, I think the hard part is, is it, it would be um, a, uh, you need to know what the budget is first. So I think if you come back to us and you, you can do this in after hours or contact some of us on, but but I don't know if you want to put that on the show, but what is your budget is the first thing to look at because, um, you know, if you're backing into the budget, um, then then we can make a lot of decisions really quickly. Uh, I worked on one smaller town and, you know, we had a actually a reasonable budget, like a, a small budget for a town, even though it's a town, it's still was hundreds of thousands of dollars <laughs> to spend on a, on a town. So it's not like it it it, it needs to be it, it is you know we're going to you know decide that uh you got to let us know like is it, is this a is this a $50,000 project, a $500,000 project, a $5 million project and and we would approach those in very different ways. 
one of the things that we worked on is a lot of the town um, municipality buildings were not that far apart. So we really worked out how to get fiber between all of them. So we ran uh, TAC-12 between all the buildings, um, TAC-24 between a couple of them. Um, and, uh, and we oftentimes had primary and backup routes. Once we did that, everything was kind of tied together. We want to put more internet back and forth, video, audio. Everything is is becomes much more much easier to get between the towns. Then there was you know um, uh, bandwidth that we provided. You know basically Wi Fi for only employees or only people working on the productions. Um, you know a lot of other things that we we were able to kind of add to it to allow us to have a lot of control over that. Uh, I would, you know, an integrator can help a lot. I think guys right there. You want to see integrators that actually do production, though. Um, the integrators that don't do any production uh, oftentimes don't give you good ideas. <laughs> they give you expensive ones. So, you know, we're looking for people who, you know, when we work with integrators, we want to see there are ones out there. There's here in the Bay Area, for instance, there's ASG. And ASG does a lot of production as well as a lot of integration. Um, and that gives them a much more practical understanding of what you need as opposed to, what makes sense for them as an integrator because it's a very different thing uh, you know what makes sense to sell you as an integrator is very different than what makes sense to actually do production so you you know having an integrator that does production is something you want to really look at they are very valuable uh, as long as they're doing both if they're just an integrator um, i tend to shy away from them because they oftentimes provide expensive solutions that are that take a lot of maintenance by them to uh, keep up and so so those are the things that we kind of um, are always concerned about there um, next question Next one comes from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. OpenAI is exploring making its own AI chips. What are the implications of this? Uh, go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, the, the key word here is exploring. They haven't done anything yet. There's been rumors that they've uh, been working on acquiring a company that does make chips. Uh, but bringing in the hardware, I wouldn't be surprised within 5, 10 years that they bring in some sort of chip hardware. Uh, but we, they still have to worry. We're still going through a massive chip shortage. Uh, and we saw that with Apple with the M3 chips, the three nanometer chips, and how Apple is juggling certain devices right now. So you can still have your iPhone 15 and, uh, and, and move from there. So they're, they're going to have to deal with that. And then, of course, NVIDIA, which is top of the game on this whole thing, uh, they they're, I don't know if they plan to alienate them or if they plan to work with them uh, and maybe creating companionship uh, that could help out. But I think that that would uh, definitely shift in the market and they'd have a lot of headaches that they'd have to do on the hardware side. If they're ready for that, then it's possible. Yeah. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, and they're going to face a lot of competition, like you, like uh, Jeffrey said. Nvidia has been a top player, but and Intel has spun off their a new division called Habana for its deep learning products, and they have a series of Gaudi, Gaudi Two, and Synapse AI that are chips that are designed uh, specifically for training uh, large uh, AI large language models. So they're going to be competing with uh, the big name players like Intel. And, uh, you know, NVIDIA. So, uh, of course, Microsoft does have a lot of money. Next question. Next one in also comes from the QR code drop. Danny Grizzle in Longview, Texas. Opinions, pro and con, about the red cinema camera workflow and ecosystem. I'm in my mid-60s and considering purchase of a final camera for personal work, not client projects, looking for image quality paramount. Guy. Yeah, the image quality is paramount. There is so much color fidelity inside of that codec. And so they were able to get the market with a patent on, on their codec, uh, which allows for very lightweight files with uh, lots of information and dynamic range. Uh, so you can download some clips on their website. That's what I would suggest doing just to get a, a grasp of the workflow is grab some of those sample clips, download them, run them through. Uh, their app and see if that works for you. You, will, if you were to compare similar files from other manufacturers, you'd just see what I'm talking about. And it's it's quick. If you, you will need a fast machine. So that's the thing is you want to torture test this stuff to see if it's worthwhile. What I love about the red cameras is the interface on the cameras is is really amazing. I mean, I love Black Magic, but man, red just it stomps. I mean, there's 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 no comparison. There's a reason why they use it in, in feature films. I mean, it's very professional. All the tools are there. They're fast. It's stable. Um, that wasn't always the case, but nowadays the Red Komodo and the Red Komodo X are just hot cameras, and you're looking at about ten grand for for to get started and be aware that there's lots of bits and pieces: the monitor, the handle, the proprietary um, 
uh, Limo little connectors. So that's one of the cons is that you can get into having to rig it out and it winds up being uh, a lot more expensive than you bargained for. So uh, watch lots of YouTube. There's amazing reviews on these cameras. So that's where I would start is go to the website, download some clips, watch some videos on YouTube. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. I don't disagree with anything Guy just said. I mean, they, they do have, they've been at the top of the quality pyramid for a long time. They've done a really good job there. The only thing I would question is just, I don't see the same kind of investment in R&D out of Reb. Now, maybe they have something in the back room they haven't been talking about. But, you know, when I was starting out, you'd buy a camera and you could get 10 years out of it. When you're talking about a last one that's going to last, um, I, it, it wouldn't shock me if somebody from one of the big camps, and that could be uh, somebody like Blackmagic, somebody from Sony, somebody from even um, some of the traditional camera manufacturers who have been working really hard in the back end, coming up with a sensor or a new thing that does a new kind of color science. And I say that because there's been tons of research and really color has changed dramatically from when I was even in the mid part of my career, more automation, more ability for color science to be locked in place at the beginning. The the results we're getting out of even our little computer phones that has taken computer consistency a long way. That doesn't mean that a phone is doing color as well as a system like you're talking about. And if that really is your focus, then you might want to keep going where you're going. Uh, find a big investment camera and hope it's going to be there for the end of your career. But I just also see on the bleeding edge, there's a lot of change going on out there. And I would hate to drop a lot of money on something right now and then yep. when yep. it comes out in a year or two years. Good guy. Yeah, one other quick note, when I was in the training and they were showing off some of the 8K footage of the V-Raptor and then downsampled, it is amazing what you can do when you take an 8K image and downsample it to HD. So that's another thing to research is, and that's where they got another angle on the market. So be aware of that. Yeah, one of the big advantages um, with, the, with the RED also is the um, global shutter. <laughs> so that's, you know, like I think that that, that's a, that's, that becomes important important choice for folks that I work with, especially if you're working with LED or any high motion. Next question. Guy Cochran, Seattle, Washington, or Seattle, USA. Yeah, in Washington. What camera or cameras would you choose to put on a tank cart for rolling a live signal from a trade show? Uh, go ahead, uh, Jeffrey. I'm still a big fan of Sony's. Uh, going through and, and checking everything out, yeah, Blackmagic would be a nice one. But uh, for me, with the autofocus, because uh, especially I'm assuming, Guy, that you're uh, that there's going to be somebody that's doing some sort of controlling on the card, uh, handling and things like that. Uh, so I, I still think that sometimes you just need some relief and and not having to worry about things like focusing a camera could be a great asset. Uh, on the other hand, I'd also, uh, if the power is not an issue, I'd also have some sort of PTZ camera in there. Maybe, uh, especially with some of these that do have the AI ability to track and stay on a subject. Uh, so it'd be kind of nice. Once again, you get a little bit more hands-free on it. And then of course, with the PTZ camera, you if you need to focus on a product, you can easily do that without having to walk over to the camera and move it up and down. And then of course, one more camera that would have to, that in some way should be detachable so and wireless so you could actually walk around the, the product and get a side shot uh, and hope that you can keep your connection. A good guy. Yeah, I'd really love to see a behind the scenes of us doing one of these where I know that as you were walking along, Alex, and the group was following you, the train, you called it. It's, I'm trying to make it easier and envision what, what works because Noah's scenario was pretty nice where he used what he had, which was, I believe, a couple FS5s. And that worked out well because he was able to use, you know, the traditional rocker style zoom. So he had one close up camera, one wide shot, and then he had a switcher so he could bounce back and forth and frame up those shots while one was not hot. So it was it was nice to have that that one person's controlling two cameras. But on this last uh, rolling cart, I, I requested that somebody take control remotely because I didn't have an operator. So it just got me thinking, uh, like Jeffrey said, what can we do with a PTZ remotely where we have like maybe three cameras where one's a, a GoPro style, just witness camera that's giving you an overview of where everything's at. And then they can remotely pick what they want. So the director could be like, Hey, he's going to talk about this feature of the, of the product. 
go go in for the close up of of that. Yeah. And I, so I, as I, we go to NAB New York, I'm just curious as to what and other shows in the future what would work best. Having yeah, I, mean, I, I, I think that I think that the multiple we're really trying to move all the production out of it out of the space so that there, we're using whether it's um, you know IP connections or live views with multiple channels or other things like that is to not have any mixing any switching on the ground. <laughs> so the idea is just send all of all the channels back to master control and let and let us cut the cut the show there and call it. Now if we have an IP connection. Um, we can still control um, pan tilt zoom cameras, and so we could s move them around. If I, I think if I was doing a tank right now, I would probably use the FR sevens. Like the FR sevens are the you know the you know it's going to look really nice. Um, they've got great autofocus. It's going to give it kind of a classic look. I, I use a lot of FR sevens right now, so I'm I'm very familiar with them. Um, so they're 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 the ones I'm the most comfortable with at this point. They're a little quirky to get started, and then once they get started, they they look great. You know, and so um, I I have to admit though that I'm uh, very like I, don't, I do not like anything less than Super 35. So if, if, if the chip is smaller than Super 35, I don't, don't really consider it part of my productions anymore. So, so I don't, um, so that kind of, I kind of wash away a lot of other options pretty quickly for the kind of stuff that I like to do anyway. Um, uh, but I think that I, it, the FR7s are great and they keep getting better with firmware updates. So um, I think that those are the best ones. I, I do wish, app, I do wish uh, Blackmagic would think about PTZs. <laughs> Be great. <laughs> anyway, next question. David Brady, New York. Are there any recommended turnkey systems to get started with Unreal Engine? What are some of the better brands on hardware specs? And he's looking for RAM, graphics, motherboard, I.O., and so forth. You know, to get started, uh, a good gaming machine is going to be enough. You know, like, like I think that, you, you know, like if you get a strong gaming machine that's out there for two or $3,000, you're going to have enough to get started with, with, uh, with Unreal. I think that um, I built a bigger system that that did that, and I think that you can. Um, I, I don't know if we can we'll have enough time in the la in the end of this hour to go through all the, the long list of them, but um, I tend to lean towards you know AMD, you know thread rippers, you know for for that type of thing as well. The one that the one that I built has a thread ripper, and then NVIDIA cards. Um, the NVIDIA cards tend to work a little bit better. I think you know currently the four thousand series are pretty good, um, but the but I would. Uh, I would lean towards a game, a strong gaming engine to get started. The, the new machines are really powerful, <laughs> and and when you get when you grow out of that, then you can really get more serious about it. Yeah, go next question. Right, oh, Hoff, sorry, Tom. Oh, did you, are you having trouble hitting the thing? Guy, uh, it was know. gone. But uh, just quick okay. note, uh, I know why David's asking this question is because he was standing next to me as we were. Uh, oogling over the behind the scenes uh, unreal computer that they had at zoomtopia and they were saying that last year they they had over three hundred thousand dollars worth of hardware to do what they wanted to do and this year they had a four thousand uh, dollar bit it was a huge box i don't know yeah. what was in the box but i think it was from puget systems i'm not sure but we'll have to ask andy yeah absolutely next question Ronnie Hofsoy, tromsu norway if we one. get I, we're having uh, a lot con of trouble we're skipping okay. we skip we're having a lot of trouble with our uh, qa stuff today um, yeah, let me go back. Oh, there we go. Um, James Babbitt, San Diego. Please show on. Alex's video clip okay. from the iPhone 3G. No, that wasn't what we what did we have here. No. Okay. I'm not. Gonna, I, I don't have time to show it, but you can see it on on, on YouTube. Uh, I tweeted it out today. I I was looking for something else, and I found it, and uh, um, the uh, and I put it up just because I thought it was funny. It was from 2009, um, and so it's on my YouTube channel. Uh, if you go to Alex Lindsay and. Uh, uh, on YouTube, and you can see it. It's from 2009. It's me getting excited about a, a, an iPhone uh, with video, and it was the first one. And I feel like the 15 is the first one that really. I mean, the 15 is we got to what I could see in 2009 that we were going to get to eventually. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm pretty pretty excited. I'm still pretty excited about it. Um, anyway, so that's that's there. Uh, quick uh, reminder, of course, that we have um, we have the panelist. Uh, sign up still available. You can you can sign up for that, and uh, you can see that in the Alex announcements, also in the email that goes out. We're going to have a there's an opening for new panelists uh, tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. I'll be doing a little walkthrough of that. So um, so so if you're interested in that, go ahead and um, throw that throw your uh, name in there, and we'll reach out to you and make sure that you know how to get to the meeting tomorrow. Um, also, of course, Saturday a reminder that Saturday is the um, the test uh, morning. Um, so you're going to see a couple of those. We're going to do this a couple times. You're going to see Saturdays are going to be, we're testing HDR uh, 5.1 um, and 4K uh, transmission. You'll see a couple glitches and us kind of working through stuff. Still, still Q&A for as long as we get questions, but it's also combined with us doing color and audio management, which will get more and more complicated as we go through the rest of the year. We're actually going to use the week of Thanksgiving and the week of Christmas 
also as a um, as a time where we test the whole day, the whole week. So we're really trying to get ready to go to 4K HDR 5.1 regularly in in 2024. Um, and so what we're doing is you'll see more and more testing, but Saturday is going to be that test um, that, that we're working on there. Sunday, of course, is introspection. If you haven't seen Sunday, it's, it's, a, it's a fun fun day. <laughs> so we we uh, if you have questions or comments or concerns about office hours, that's the right day to bring it up. Um, so uh, so those are the days we don't broadcast that day. So you never see it if you're just watching the regular day-to-day -day show. So definitely um, check that out. Um, and uh, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see you there on Sunday morning. Let's go ahead and jump into the second hour. And we're back for the second hour. Welcome back to um, to our, our second hour. You might wonder what that black <laughs> going to do. We're getting ready to be able to automate clipping. So um, so that's why if you're wondering why you see this little thing by going to black and having it to the second over top of the eight o'clock hour, we're, we're able to kind of automate something where we can start separating these hours out um, automatically. So if you're wondering why we do that, um, we are going to start adding video where I just talked there a second ago, we're gonna be adding video um, to that. Um, so so I think that that's, you know, so if you're wondering why we're doing something so crazy, it's because we're, um, we're, we're getting, you know, as always, you know, office hours is kind of a moving target. So we're always, um, you know, building new, new pipelines um, to, uh, to, 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 to move this stuff forward. So that's what that, that's what's going on there. Anyway, uh, today we're going to talk about cables. Um, and I don't know if anyone here wants to talk about anything that they think is important. Uh, I think that um, what we, what we run, want to talk about here is really thinking about all the things that are related to cables, because it's not just uh, specifically, um, you know, and there's, there's already, already have some questions popping up, but it's, um, uh, it's, you know, how we choose them, how we run them, how we plan them, how do we, you know, all those bits and pieces. Um, there's a lot to it. And, you know, until we get to a point where everything's wireless, we do have to kind of know uh, how to approach this. Jason, I'll let you kick it off. All right. Um, so for me, there, there are two main branches here. The, the first one is permanent installation. The second is, you know, temporary slash portable installation. And, um, one of the reasons that uh, I and definitely Alex was so excited about USDZ is that if you're if you're doing some sort of major installation and and you can very quickly get a you know a floor plan, this will allow you to measure every conceivable. What if I run from here to there? What if I run from there to here? And this you know this is a large office space that I modeled in. <laughs> I, it was really quick and, uh, I mean, l easily less than an hour, maybe 45 minutes. You can also do this with something like Polycam, but I like nice clean walls because it'll allow you to do any sort of angle that, that you can think of. And um, that, that really, for me at least, has solved a whole bunch of problems for permanent installation. For, for on-site installation, um, I actually I use climbing gear sometimes to clip to my belt. But um, getting a getting zip ties that can be pulled out, right, with with the release clip is very handy. And this is a glow in the dark zip tie holder that I have on a, a carabiner that is very handy. My most recent find for the whole thing is I've my, my buddies at Klein's Tools. Um, this is a Velcro uh, zip tie dispenser. So you can clip it on your belt and it affixes magnetically on the back. So you, it, it's, it's large, it's a little unwieldy, but if you're, if you're trying to run cables, I hate having to go back and forth and this will just dispense the amount that you want and then just let you clip it. And for safety, it'll lock back and, um, and then it won't move at all. So pretty durable and pretty tough and definitely the, the, the right place to start because I hate cables. I, for me, it's really more of cable tolerance than cable management. Yeah, a, a couple things here. I'll, I'll just talk talk through a couple of things to just show you some examples of things to think about um, as far as cable, like just what to th the things that we're thinking about when we when we do this here. Um, here is a, uh, this is this is what a, a kit looks like in backstage. Now, the problem is we have a day to put that up. So, so what we, what a lot of that looks like before we get to that is, um, if I can get my 
keystroke in the right place. This is that system all built, sorry for the little slight angle there, um, but this is the, that system built to every room. This is for a Dreamforce a while ago. Um, and, um, but it's every single room all over the West Hall. Um, we, were, we ran all the cabling that we would need, sands the fiber that's going to be in the building so that we knew that all those kits were ready to go and that they were all ready, you know, and we can spend the time doing that. A lot of times here's another build for the same event later um, or, or, you know, and so you can see us kind of working out um, a lot of the layout. It is much easier to uh, for us to be building this and figuring it out when we have all of our gear up here and we're figuring out what the cable, this is messy right now, but we're figuring out those cables. We're even figuring out where we put our, um, you know, where we put our power cables and so, you know, power and everything else. Um, the, uh, but, but it's important to be able to do this in, you know, beforehand, a lot of times people get into this, um, uh, and they're doing it, trying to figure this out on site. And I'm not a big figuring out on site kind of guy. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, so, um, so those are the kind of things that we look at. Another thing to look at is when you're on site, as far as cable runs go, um, one of the things that you'll see here is that we really pay attention to, you know, keeping it as clean as possible. It's never going to be perfect when you're doing a, a this is a two hour load in. And so, um, so a lot of this is going to be still kind of messy back here, but we really try to, you know, make, make sure this is a very high profile event. And we wanted to make sure that, um, that we keep it nice and clean. Um, we also got to pay attention to where we can put, uh, you know, either um, cable, tape, you know, you, you talk to people about that a lot before you get started. Um, here, one of the things that, that you'll see in the behind some of our photos are what we call these little cable boats. Um, these are boats that we that we have we had in our in our last warehouse. And um, what these look like, if you see them, let's see if I have another. Um, so I thought I had another angle there. You can kind of see them, one of them hanging over here. So as we're doing builds, what what we do here is anything under three feet was hanging from these uh, racks here put the very long cables in the bottom because that weights them down, put some big casters on them, and then put rolls on the other side. That's what you could see over here. So we can roll the stuff up here and keep it clear. What's nice about that is as you're doing a build, um, we just move those around. <laughs> so we just move that, and, and we had one that's IT, one that's audio, one that's video. And so you just kind of move them to where you're doing the build. That way you, you're not, what we noticed doing time-lapse was how many times we were walking a, across the room to get more cables. And so by putting them on these boats, we were able to kind of move them to where we needed to go. So you can just kind of wrap them around where you're sitting and just grab the things that you that you actually need. Um, the uh, Again, we think about a lot of things because things generate a lot of mess. So for instance, we put very regular, these are client-based um, power with uh, you know USB uh, powering as well. We think about that a lot before we get loaded because otherwise people have little extension cables running everywhere. And so by keeping them you know um, tight, uh, it's important. Now, one thing I think you can see over here, it's it's not as clear, but these ones are all etched. So um, so if the ones that are on the far end there, we actually, not only do we have convenience panels, um, but those these these the comms convenience panels, we paid a couple hundred dollars to have them actually, you can get someone to etch them with uh, white text and everything else. And it was like, this is the way we use this. And, um, and it, it allowed us to uh, really understand, you know, we have a lot of, obviously a lot of convenience panels. We try on set, to never allow anyone to plug things into our core equipment. So what we always want to do is, is try to have um, convenience panels on the outside because that way if something runs over, it catches it, pulls it, it destroys one connector connector in our convenience panel and not um, the input into our into our system there. Um, here you can see another one of the one of our little um, uh, panels here. This is the old our, our old uh, um, truck or, or trailer. Um, one of the other things to think about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only showing this because it's remarkably uh, an obvious thing that we have trouble with, but a uh, coiling cable at the bottom of wherever you're going to set something down is a super useful thing to do. So you'll see us take about 10 feet of cable or 15 feet of cable and we'll coil it down here. And the reason we're doing that is so that um, we can move it. <laughs> a lot of times people will run things and they'll run them from here out to um, to where they need to go and they don't leave any kind of slack here and then that's where you're stuck putting the cable. So a lot of times we'll coil this stuff down um, down at the bottom there. Um, same thing here, one of the things we really think about as we start to work on these is really trying to keep these clean. This is a place where you do have to have some fluidity because the artists are gonna do it, but we really try to minimize all of this. Uh, we find that a lot of bands uh, or people who set up for the bands don't do that and it drives us a little crazy. Um, so, um, so a lot of times we, um, we try to keep that as clean as possible. It just makes it better, better for shooting. Um, these are uh, looms. So this is not a, a, 
a group, you know, this is not a pre-built cable. Um, these are all the cables we need for these PTZs. These are the BRC900. So we have some, we have a little bit of, we have power and we have uh, the SDI and I think one more cable there and um, ethernet. And uh, so, but we put these and these are, these are looms that go around the cables and you can buy them like hundred foot looms. And uh, it's a way for you to build them with that, you know, and you still have the flexibility. I think, I think Courtney talked about these in the past where you can open them back up, put new things in, pull things out. And it, it, it's a, it's a really convenient way to do it. Here's a close up of one of our convenient panels. Um, so by marking these all, we can kind of tell you what, how they're connected into the, into the system here. Um, and they're, they're, you can see that we have some that are RJ45, some that are, are these, these are, you'll see that these are screwed in. So in this, in this case, this is, we can mix and match SDI, uh, RJ45, um, XLR, anything else, HDMI, USB, all of those things can be mixed and matched throughout the entire panel to give us exactly uh, what we want. Um, another thing that, that I do, and I, I think I have one laying around here somewhere I was going to show you, but um, uh, I am, a, uh, as other people have <laughs> probably heard me say, I'm a huge fan of the Neutrik rear twist uh, SDI cables. So um, these are the, um, uh, these cables here allow us to color them. Um, and, uh, and so that's, a, it, it, it's much easier for us to, to handle. We also um, have a tendency to do in and outs um, at different colors of cable as we build them. So those are things to think about is, um, you know, having multiple colors allows us to see throughout the entire thing. You know, we know that this is an input or an output. Um, we also know what the numbers are. In this case, these are, these don't have colors, but down here, it makes it much easier for us to know what the, what the cadence is. And it allows you, especially on fast builds, um, to go a lot faster, you know, to connect those things. Another thing to think about are cable trays. Um, so this this helps a lot as far as keeping things up and above. And um, it's remarkable how how time how if someone hasn't worked in a server room, how little they think about that. But running those trays along it, and also, I mean, these are trays right above our servers. But you can also um, in larger facilities, you'll put tr cable trays around all around the the room. So you just run them up there and, and move them around. Um, and it makes it a lot easier to uh, to manage. Anyway, a couple, I just thought that those might be a couple useful photos. Um, the last things I was gonna talk about was, here's the, um, the uh, this is a, a cable that's pre-made. Of course, you can buy these, but this is, so this is actually truly one cable that has, you know, four XLRs on each end, and I'm using this for the, for the uh, Ambisonic. But you can have these, you can have any combination of these built. So this is something that can be done. Um, you can go to Gepco or, or car, you know, a couple different cable companies and they, you just tell them, I want this, 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 I want this long and they'll give you a cable that looks like that. And it does massively increase the speed at which you can set up once you know what your system is. If, if you don't know what your system is, it's not a good idea because then you wish you had put in another cable or taken one out. Um, this, is, this is more of the, the, um, the these, these are two different color cables. Um, with the RJ, uh, with the, with, I'm sorry, with the rear twists. And um, it just, it really it makes a big difference in my opinion. These are the old ones. Um, this is the ones we used to have here and um, I hate them now. Um, so they were, they were great when we had them. This is the Canary. But when I, I, at one point I got rid of almost everything that wasn't rear twist because it's just harder on your hands. <laughs> and, and, and so, and, and they work well, the Canary ones work well when you, um, have a you have a trumpeter and that's a little a cable that you push in and you turn it. I don't have a trumpeter here because I have rear twist cables. Um, but uh, the problem with the trumpeter is it's adding leverage and over time it will damage your your uh, connections. And so um, we try not to use them if we, if we can avoid it, except for like the initial setup if we have to. Another thing to think about are flat cables. Um, this is this is an ethernet cable here um, that's flat and that's, that's it's good to know that those exist <laughs> so that you can get them under doors. Um, that's usually what we use them for. And then, I, and I, I don't know if the other, I, I, I'm, I do a lot of cloth braided cables because they slide around easier. So they get through things easier. They coil easier. They, they go into my kits easier. So for shorter cables, um, those are some things to think about. So those are my, my quick thoughts on that. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, a couple of tips uh, uh, Jason was talking about using tie wraps. I avoid using nylon tie wraps on any coaxial cable. You can use it for CAT6 or something, but using them on coax is problematic because you tighten them down too much 
and it can change the impedance of the cable. It can cause intercable reflections. It's not good. Uh, so, and also, if somebody pulls on it, they can damage the cable, especially if you're running optical cables anywhere. You don't want to uh, put anything that you know uh, any tug on it would would cause it to cut into the cable or crimp the cable. So, uh, what I found, I found this stuff a long time ago. Uh, that is Velcro. Uh, it's a polyester with hooks on one side, loops on the other side, and you just pull it off and cut a length and it sticks to itself. It doesn't get any schmutz on your cable. If it gets hot, you can uh, you know, unzip it, add a new cable to it, zip it back up. And it's great for running cables uh, in a temporary situation where you want to group a bunch of cables into a loom and then um, attach it to a, a the leg of a chair or a table, let's say. Um, it's great for that kind of stuff. I wouldn't use tie wraps. I wouldn't use anything. The problem is with nylon tie wraps, uh, you have to use you know a pair of end cutters or a pair of cutters to cut them off. You can't easily remove them. There are some that have little releases on them, but still that nylon can cut into the cable. So I, I advise against doing that. Um, that's oh, one other thing to watch out for is if you're going to put cables in cases, uh, beware the foam. If there's foam in the cases, a lot of the uh, some of that PVC or natural rubber jacketed cable has uh, stuff that leaches out, has a uh, uh, solvent that will you know leach out of the cable eventually and it will turn the foam into goo. And then you have a gooey cable that is really hard to clean. So uh, keep that in mind. Be careful about polyester foam inside cable cases. Um, <laughs> some good comments in here. Uh, David Brady did point out in the comments that, uh, that the trumpeter um, uh, and the non-noitrix are still in use in long-term permanent installs. And he's absolutely, he's absolutely right. Uh, we have a tendency to pull our, I have a tendency to pull stuff apart and put it back together often. Also, I have a tendency to want to color code things even when they're in installs. And so I still use those there, but I, we do run into the other ones. Um, and uh, the trumpeter does make sense when you're doing large installs permanently. It, what you don't want to do is do them if you're taking kits apart all the time um, because of that, that angle of, of incidence. Uh, David also said the other thing is the tie wraps. If you don't clip them right, you'll shred your extremities when fishing around in the rack. And you're absolutely right. When we're, if we're going to put stuff in racks, a lot of times um, what we try to do is, is take the tie wraps off. I mean, so the cables won't have tie wraps if they're in the wraps for exactly the reason, unless we're going to try to wrap them to a side or attach them to the side. Um, and um, the uh, the so I always, for anything that's going into a case or that I'm going to put in there, I have the tie wrap. I have a tie wrap that's on every single cable, and I have like a roll of them that I add to add to cables as I put them in, um, so that I can always control their own wrap there. Another little thing that that um, I have a tendency to do is is either with a tie wrap or a, or a, I've talked about this in the past, but with a tie wrap or with a, a piece of tape or even a label, I'll set I'll set it in a very hard place, and it's easier to do this with tape. Um, and I do that because I measure all my cable. Uh, my cable loops. So I'll decide my loop is, let's say this big. If they all have tape where that where I need to loop them, I can go, I can loop this around and match it. And then all the cables will be exactly the same in the same diameter. And so by having one little label out on the cable and you pull it under, you'll get all of your 50 foots, all your 25 foots. And what we do a lot of times is we have the 50 foots and the 25 foots will roll into a size that will fit inside the 50s. And the 10s will roll inside that'll fit inside of the 25s. And the only real problem with that is that it gives you a, the capability of making your case extremely heavy <laughs> because you're just, you're able to pack that copper really, really tightly, but it allows you to do that. And, you know, it looks really nice on the rack. <laughs> so to have all, all your cables that are the same length be the same diameter. Um, and it's it's just easier for you to figure out how to pack them. So it's one of the things that um, that we do a lot a lot of as we as we kind of go through that. Um, let's go to the first question. Absolutely. Our first one comes in from Robert Sababidi in Poland. And Robert says, any recommendations for video cable testers? I use Palmer Audio's tester for XLR, speaker, DIN, phono, and jacks. Love it. But how can I test an HDMI fiber cable? Go ahead, Courtney. Well, I would suggest getting um, one of the our friends, the uh, Decimator MD Cross. Uh, this is a... Um, 
a great video tester. Uh, you can plug in SDI into it, HDMI into it, and out of it. It has a little LCD screen here that will tell you what the signal is that's coming in, whether it's 1080i, 1080p, 60 hertz, 24 hertz. It'll tell you the frame rate uh, of all the like 14, 15 different uh flavors of HD video that is out there. Plus it has a built-in uh, uh, test signal generator that it can generate all these different types of high resolution uh, test screens with everything from color bars to uh, frequency scans and so on. So you can put this um, at the head of your cable and hook up the output of the cable to a high quality monitor and uh, check it to see if it has, uh, you know, if all the frequencies are making it through. So the MD Cross, it's about 395 bucks from uh, them. So it's about $400, but it does a lot of things for, um, uh, you know, it, it, it lets you diagnose a lot of stuff that uh, you couldn't do before without, with just a, a test unit to say, okay, all the, all the signals are coming, are connected. All the wires are connected. It can actually test the quality of that cable. Yeah. And there are, I mean, they're, they're testing the quality of the cables is um, a, uh, a thing that, that uh, can get very, very um, expensive. So, uh, a digital, I think it's digital report is the um, one that I see a lot of truck operators use. I, I keep on wanting to call it weather report and I have, I cannot get that out of my head. So, um, but I haven't used it. Uh, uh, you know, there are, um, uh, uh, a fair, a fair number of these, of these testers that you can use or to view signal. One thing that the HDM, the MDHX or the MDA cross has and and the thing you want to look for is a pathological SDI test. Um, this will look like a, um, a purple or pink and and gray signal. And what it does is it maximizes zeros and ones going through the system. And if you've got a problem, it usually so you'll see usually a pathological signal go through at some point when we're testing trucks and so on and so forth. And that's going to push everything kind of to the out, outer um, outer element. And I'll get the name for the. The, uh, the box that I can never remember the name of. Obviously, I don't own one, um, but I uh, but I see them and I keep on thinking about buying them. They're about seven or eight hundred dollars. They get much more expensive as you um, as you start to go up um, for these. Most of the boxes that we see roaming around um, at an event are about seven or eight thousand um, dollars. So uh, we'll I'll, I'll give you some names here in just a second. Let's go to the next question. Andy Kokendor for VR Florida. We have all experienced cable spaghetti at events. How do you determine when the pile of knots is not worth unwinding? Go, Jason. Oh, if you're planning well, then this won't happen. But yes, it does. It, on, at times, uh, I think it all comes down to the countdown clock. Do you have the time, times two or three, to be dead sure that you can get it exactly back to the way that it needs to be? Yeah, go, Courtney. If it's Cat Six and you're running Dante, uh, just cut cut it off with the connectors and leave it to the cleanup crew for the stadium to clean up later. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that um, uh, you generally need to think about it at the beginning. Um, if you are at an event and you're setting up, you're going to have what you're going to have. Once you start piling that stuff up. You got to be careful. And that's why if you saw that picture that I showed of us having all the rooms all laid out and all of our cables figured out, and then we have a bunch of extra cables that we bring with us, but there's not going to be in figuring out, you know, pushing people to kind of roll everything, you know, so that it's kind of in, an, in a relatively nice, but at the end, you are going to be adding things and moving things around and it's going to be a little messy. Um, and so, but I generally, once I'm in a show, I'm not going to, that's a, that's like a little thread on your sweater. <laughs> you start pulling those things out and suddenly nothing works. But that's why pre-planning is so important. And it's one of the advantages of owning equipment when I used to have a warehouse full of equipment is that we could do all that pre-pro over a week or two and then roll in and just roll it out. And I will tell you that it makes you look a lot better <laughs> in front of, in front of the clients because everyone else is still digging through all this stuff and you're just kind of laying everything out the way you had it. Um, and it's it's actually less expensive because in the in the warehouse you're paying your warehouse staff to put that together, and on site you're paying union dues, union union scale to to do that. And so it's way cheaper to do it in your office uh, if if you have the uh, if you have the gear. Next question. David Brady is pushing us towards religion here. Cable ties versus Velcro versus bongo cables versus red whips. Pros and cons. And he notes red whips are his fave because they're easy to see. Red whips. I'm not here's the so here's the problem. I'm not even familiar with red whips. 
Oh, red whips. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying there. So red whips are kind of like a little pull through. Uh, I can see uses for all of them. I mean, when we're building, I, what I will say is that uh, c- cable ties I don't use very often. So Velcro t- cable ties, mostly because if I do it, I don't use the gun. Just in case you're wondering, I use I, I gently tighten them to where they need to be, but I don't use a lot of cable ties because I'm afraid it's going to affect the signal. Uh, Velcro is something we use a lot, as I, as I just mentioned. The bongo cables we see a lot in um, film crews because they're very convenient to close and unclose against the camera and, and other things like that. And so they're the most convenient um, and make the least amount of noise um, as you're kind of doing those things. Uh, the Velcro, you don't want to adjust while you're shooting. <laughs> so it's so anyway, or while there's a crew going on. So um, so the uh, that's where we see the bang- bongos. And I am interested in the red whips. I'm not, I'm not as familiar, but we... we each one of these is kind of used in in different places. And and we do, I mean, I don't want to say we never use cable ties. We're just very careful if we do to not pull them super tight. We pull them tight enough to hold them where they need to be um, because they are convenient, especially if we cut them off. Um, the, the number one reason we use cable ties is actually to lock our Pelican cases when we when we fly. And the reason for that is that um, the, the TSA locks are useless because TSA let them take pictures of them um, for a, it was a Washington Post article. And so the TSA ones, you might as well not bother with the TSA lock because it's not going to do anything. Um, everybody has those. Uh, and so, but if you take a colored vel, uh, colored cable tie and put it on your case, TSA only has clear ones. And so it, when, it, when you land, you'll see any box that has clear t- cable ties, you know the TSA opened them and you can find out if they broke anything. Um, next question. Bill Mew in Turnbridge Wells, UK, is back with cables. When using SDI, should we be getting R6, R8, R59, or what? All these are available in 75-ohm coax cable with BNCs. The earlier question. You know, I don't think of them that way. Usually we, we think of them what they're rated for. Yeah, go ahead, Jason. Yeah, rating matters more than anything else. Um, I will very quickly explain to you the difference, but um, I'll uh, I'll not bury the lead. In a pinch, if you have to go to a hardware store, Quad Shield R6 is the way to go. And it's really, really important if you're going to be using BNC to get the BNC tips where that last little piece of the coax is part of the BNC, not sticking through it. And if you follow those guidelines, um, you're you're pretty much always going to be able to get a, at least a good pattern through it. Um, as a rule, I like the smaller Belkin. The issue with uh, Quad Shield is that it, although it's stronger and it's better shielded against noise, it's much harder to flex, and um, and that if you're doing more than one or two can can get a little tricky. Next question. Robert Sabobidi in Poland. What is the best way to transport cables? I use the twist left, twist right method to avoid tangles, but what should I put the cables in to transport them? Go ahead, Courtney. Well, you know, I faced this problem for years uh, with teleprompting systems. So we've got to carry a, a degree of cables with us. And we thought about cases, but cases are heavy. And once you put a bunch of cables in them, they get uh, even heavier because the case itself may weigh 20 or 30 pounds and you put about 40 pounds of cable in them, nobody can lift them. So what we came up with is we just use uh, gym bags. And the gym bags are handy because they have side pockets. So you can put connectors and adapters in the side pockets or cleaning stuff in the side pockets. And we uh, do the over under cables and do uh, a Velcro closures or we use actually shoestrings to tie up each cable. So each cable is tied up separately and laid horizontally in that gym bag. The most used cables on top, the least used cables on the bottom. And it seems to work because it's flexible, it's lightweight, the bag weighs only about a pound without the cables in it. So you're not adding to your, you know, if you're traveling on a plane or something, you can throw it on there, zip it up, and lock the zippers together uh, to prevent looky-loos. And, uh, and you're not paying for the weight of that case to ship it, and it fits into your car better. You can squeeze it into places where you couldn't squeeze a hardback case. So that's the solution we came up with, and it's worked pretty well for the last 30 years. Yeah, the, the ones that we use a lot are these, uh, there's a couple different kinds of them. I think this one's Eagle Creek, and these are little cubes. Um, so these are the cube, the cube system, and there's, they come in, they subdivide among each other in the right size. So there's big ones, little ones, et cetera. And 
I probably have a hundred of them. <laughs> you know? And so there, the nice thing is, is that the, the mesh on the top lets me look in, in to see what's in there. A lot of times on the black area, we put a, we put a gaff tape and we just write what's on it. So this is SDI, this is this, this is that. And it allows us to keep them all separate and is relatively easy to grab onto and just pull out. Um, and so we, we have been using cubes for, you know, a decade. Um, and uh, it's been, they've been pr pretty successful for us. Go Jason. When it comes to the smaller stuff, um, this is a makeup case, and I keep the desiccant in there just in case, but um, these can be reconfigured. They're inexpensive, and they're easy, to, um, they're easy to set up. And one that I got from Alex's brother and had to go back and ask oh, about, no. <laughs> a cable wallet. How could we not talk about the cable wallet, Alex? This is it's not a cheap piece of gear, what, 50, 60 bucks, but perfect, like perfect. But yeah, my brother's very, uh, very, very particular about about those things. What do you have there, Bill? Is that the same thing? This is kind of close. This is from Braun. I bought it a while ago. It's for the little small things like um, in, individual cables. Um, but I like the fact that it has a side on here that has Velcro that you can put the little tiny cables in. It keeps everything really neat. It's got uh, see-through pockets here, so longer or shorter cables. But I use this a lot. And, you know, it, it all comes up real small, and it's easy to toss like a dop kit in a bag and just have everything in one place. Uh, in a rare re reverse to an older question that I promised, I would say digital forecast. I don't know why I can't get digital forecast into my head, but digital forecast is a, is a box that we see very often on site of people looking at. I haven't needed one or haven't needed to own one. That's why I can't keep it in my head, but I always want to call it weather forecast. But a digital forecast is a great, relatively inexpensive one. The much more expensive one that has a couple extra features on it is the uh, Fabrix, uh, Fabrix handheld um, signal, uh, you know, uh, triage <laughs> but we see a lot of fabrics around when we're building cables on site usually we have a fabrics that we're kind of testing and pushing stuff through to make sure that it's uh that it's working next question Vic Hernandez in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, except for handheld cabled mics and cabled mobile instruments, are there any legitimate region reasons for on stage slack? Um yeah, I mean I think that anything that you think you might move. So a lot of times we put a little bit of a roll of I showed that earlier. Uh, that we put a little roll under where we're delivering it, um, so that it's um, so that it's there. We try to keep that relatively clean. Another thing to think about is we, we're not talking about floors right now, but um, one of the things that we've built for stages, which is life changing, is a floor riser that's like an inch and a half, you know, high. So on top of our stage, we install a floor riser that's an inch and a half high, and then it's got little openings all over. And it is, it just transforms what you do because cables are just coming out of the floor. And it, it is, uh, and, and then you can, you, and some of those are permanent, you know, um, breakout areas, but some of them are just, I just want to run a cable up here. And now there's a place that I can do that. Um, and, it, and it doesn't mean that you have no slack, but you don't have a lot of stuff running around on the top of the floor. Um, yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, one uh, thing to be careful of is closed landing because if you're just a little bit too short and that cable forms a little arc, from a stand or something to the floor, somebody's going to catch their foot on it. And with no slack, uh, they're going to pull that thing down, uh, trip over it and fall. Uh, so slack at the base of any stand or anything that could move. And a lot of times you'll set something up, a light or a mic on a stand or something on a stand that has to be cabled. And uh, you're going to have to move that stand temporarily to let a, cake, to let a rolling case by or something. Uh, so if you don't have any slack, you can't move it in one direction. So uh, always keep about three or four feet of slack in case somebody says, you know, hey, that stands just in the shot by about four inches. Well, you don't want to have to redo all your cabling to move it three inches to the right. You know, always have slack. In general, you want to think about as you're plugging these in, and I know this is a really basic thing, but slack is a good thing for you in a lot of places so a lot of times you'll see us what we don't want to do is put pressure on wherever that cable's going in and that can be the weight of the cable it can be people pulling against the cable so a lot of times what we're trying to find are places to create a little bit of slack and then using velcro or a lot or other things to just kind of attach something um, so that there's always a little bit of an extra loop there so you're not putting pressure on the connection. The connections are really expensive and so and sometimes irreplaceable. <laughs> so, so you want to try to minimize the amount of pressure being put on those connections at all times. Next question. 
David Brady in New York City. When planning a convenience panel for a mobile rig, what's the ratio of I.O. needed? I have a 40 by 40 smart hub in my cart just trying to figure out a balance for getting outboard gear into the mix. So it depends. <laughs> it's not all of it because a lot of your routing is internal. So if you, I mean, it depends on what you have there. But if you're, if you have a kit that's rolling in, this is where we build. I mean, I, I build wiring diagrams of everything that I build. Any major build that I have, I've got a wiring diagram that says this is where everything's going. And um, and so what I do is you figure that out, and you've got you may have a bunch of I/O that's going between the switcher and the and the forty by forty. Um, you've got the recording decks. You've got a lot of other things there. Anything I have left after I've done all of that, I might have a couple spares inside just to make sure that if there's something else I add, I might have like uh, four channels or six channels of, of, of just extras after I've built it. The rest of those I'm going to put on the outside panel because if you don't put them on the outside panel after that, you're not going to, um, you're never going to use them <laughs> or you're going to be doing something weird where you're pulling them down. So, so I'll expose everything after I've done all my internal connections. And again, I wire it. I don't do it, you know, I, when I wire a, a, a kit, I'm looking at a diagram and plugging this into this and this into this. I'm not thinking about it. The thinking is all done on paper to make sure that I know where those things go. And then um, anyway, so then and then you're now you're building that up. And so you you that should be something that's relatively obvious to you um, when you have it as of, of to what it is. But it's not a certain ratio. It's it's a what do you have left after you've done your internal components? And usually it won't be enough because you'll have, uh, you will have given up too many. So you have to kind of think about, do I need all the ox sends or do I need all of these other things? And so it's more of a ratio of what you use. Like when you have something like a constellation, you know, you have so much IO that it's hard to, it's hard to figure out what you're going to do because until they had the 80 by 80 router, there was no way to really even um, serve the IO, serve the IO on the constellation without doing a lot of other things. So, so, I mean, all to the router. The other thing to think about here is potentially patch panels. So patch panels are a less expensive solution to some degree um, that are, and which I, we're not, I don't have any good pictures of, but we have a whole, the whole back of some of our racks are all patch panels. These are, these are where I'm hard routing things over. And the reason for that is those patch panels magnify your router. So you have a, you have a software router, your 40 by 40 smart hub that you can sit there and just patch through but we can also patch them with wires and you see these a lot in trucks because if you have to do a different configuration you simply can't afford to have um, enough routing to really do all everything there you have to make it move um, piece by piece uh, next question next one comes to us from robert sababidi in poland again and oh i'm sorry roscoe jones is up at the top now roscoe in madison indiana how would you protect cables that are not in conduit but may be in place for months power versus signal and at what point do you require conduit or permanent protection go ahead jason um well you shouldn't run your power and your signal anywhere near each other so with that in mind um braids um so you know you can get braided like this stuff is insanely cheap and it's a big pain in the butt to get on there you can also get uh less specific um like spiral around pieces to um to, to kind of just keep everything tight and then as far as protecting it just get it off the floor go ahead courtney yeah as alex had mentioned earlier cable trays are, are really neat if it's going to be a, you know uh you're going to put a studio in and you're going to use it for six months or something you can find these cable trays that you can hang from suspended ceilings uh and uh, root all your cabling cabling up and away from the floor uh and that way you're not tying the cable down the things cables can exit at multiple points along the cable trays to feed to different things and when they're up high, uh, they're out of the shot, out of the frame, and you can shoot underneath them easier. Uh, and it's easier to troubleshoot because you're not dealing with, you know, 15 cables in a loom that is tied tightly and you've got to extract one that can be problematic. It's easier when they're laying horizontally in a cable tray. Just don't route your AC cables in the same tray as all your signal cables. Next question. Robert Sabobody in Poland. Managing cables also means maintaining cables. What sort of maintenance do the members of the panel carry out on their cables? Good, Bill. 
Uh, for me, it's a process of bringing them back into the studio every time I use them and doing an assessment. Particularly if you're gaff taping down cables and you're pulling it off, you can get little sticky things that end up in it. Over time, that builds up on cables. So I used to keep a couple of uh, solvents, uh, usually goof off and goo gone and things like that, some clean towels. And on return, I would undo the cables, just give them a, a quick once over to make sure that I was taking off any sticky stuff that was going to build up over time. Um, taking care of your cables is really smart because at the same time, you'll you'll see whether or not you've gotten it run over or something like that. And you don't want to have that become manifest on the next shoot when you're depending on it for your signals. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, basically the same stuff that Bill said. I, I, you know, people stick gaffer's tape, cables down with gaffer's tape, and it gets gaffer tape gunk all over it, uh, especially if it gets hot. So Goo Gone or uh, uh, Goof Off. Goof Off is a little stronger than Goo Gone. Goo Gone, I think, uses a, an orange-based, oil-based uh, petroleum distillate to, to dissolve that gunk and get it off your cables. And it also does another thing is it, it uh, kind of lubricates the cable jacket to keep it from cracking and drying out. And that's another thing over a long period of time, cables can dry out and crack and when they get old. And if you keep, if you clean them periodically with, you can use WD-40 too, because uh, it keeps water out and water from attacking the jacket or the cables, especially if they're rubber jacketed. Uh, use that on it every now and then, and it will keep them nice and supple, but they will smell funny in your bag for a while. <laughs> uh, next question. Vincent Alvarez in Bellingham, Washington. What tips or tricks do you have on how to dress cables for a sit-stand desk with two PCs sitting on the floor and all the connecting cables? I'm worried about the dozen cables pulling out or getting stressed. Good, Jason. Have I got a toy for you? Um, one of the really more expensive ergonomic uh, desk manufacturers has a this piece, which is uh, a magnetic cable conduit that has this is the real trick with this tiny little notch, so that so that things don't get pulled as they're getting pulled up. Um, I want to say this is maybe forty bucks. Uh, I'm blanking on the name, but yeah, this this is the way to do it for a sit stand. I mean, the main thing is to figure out when you're at the, at the highest point, you know, get make sure that you've got a little bit of extra there, and then when you go down, where is it going? And figuring out how to attach it and let it coil. Uh, next question, Dan in Proctor, uh, Minnesota. How do I stop a cat from eating my computer cables and audio equipment cables behind my desk? came in from the QR code. That was out of what I was laughing at before. I was uh, I was reading that. I was like, what? Uh, go ahead, Jason. I love this question. Um, first things first, just get it, you know, get the cables off the floor. And I'm, I'm going to give the same answer that I gave a moment ago. Get webbing so that all your cables are in one nice little thing. And then um, cats can jump really high, but uh, they, they can't eat really high. So uh, keep that in mind. Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, capsaicin oil, unless you have a Mexican hairless, and they seem to love the flavor of that. that <laughs> uh, yeah, it's tough to keep cats off. Some say capsaicin oil will, you know, once they chew on that and get uh, a hot a hot mouth, uh, they, they may stop chewing on it. But it's hard, you know, keep your cats away from your equipment. You know, and that's kind of hard because they're seeking warmth all the time. And, and as far as the looms go, they love to stretch their claws and that stuff. You know, it just is great for them. Good, good, Bill. This is peripheral, and I'll do it real quick. But in my car engine, the Japanese cars had used some sort of soy-based thing, and roof rats got in there and ate up everything. So it just drove me nuts, and it was an extremely expensive thing, and I've never forgotten it. So make sure you buy premium cables and you don't buy junk that may have something that attracts pests. Next question. Next one comes from Idris Hagee in Fairfax, Virginia. What flat Ethernet cable brand would you recommend for sliding under doors? Go ahead, Jason. I've never used flat Ethernet cable for more than gigabit, so keep that in mind. Uh, Monoprice has a just fine series of, of flat Ethernet, and I would not terminate them myself. Yeah, these are, um, this one is a 25 and it's a uh, Cat 7, so it's rated for 10 gigs. Um, and they make these, these are Terra Grand, um, and they make 
up to 75 feet. The 75 foot one is like $26. Um, these have worked great for me. I don't have any strong opinion about them other than when I plugged them in, they worked. So, and they, and they go under a lot of things. Uh, next question. Next one comes from Eduardo Augustine in Panama, Pennsylvania, or Panama, Panama. What are thoughts on running double cables for insurance, two HDMI, two SDI, and so forth? It seems redundant, but my opinion, it wastes resources. Uh, we, um, I do a lot of that. It just depends on, on what you're doing. Main big groups of signals we tend to try to run. And also if we just, if we're in an area that we're concerned about. The Ethernet is what we worry about the most. Sometimes it's just not practical. Like you can't run multiple cables to, um, like I might not run multiple cables to each camera in, a, in an event, but oftentimes those cameras are, all, cameras are all coming back to a fiber location. So in the center of the room, I'm oftentimes the center camera is getting a, a TAC-12 and that TAC-12 is carrying all of my video signals back to my truck. I'm not sending each video signal on its own that run is redundant. <laughs> so, so I have two runs of that going back um, to from those um, and they're going usually in two different directions and then come back. But I don't run it, but all the individual cameras are coming back um, as, a, as a single loop um, typically, um, especially when you have construction going on. So for instance, we did an event at CES where it was for a very large brand and we ran multiple signals to every drop that we were going to have. And 30% of our cables were crushed when they were putting everything because we had to put them in before they finished the booth. Like it had to go in early and 30% of them were crushed. And fortunately, not two runs and anyone, any one location. So, so we still had signal everywhere we needed it. Um, and that was because we ran redundant. Um, but again, Ethernet, we oftentimes were, are very, very concerned about um, doing that. Uh, next question. Roscoe Jones, Madison, Indiana. Do you agree that zip ties are fine for regular low voltage cabling, but have no place in network cabling? Go ahead, Jason. In principle, I completely agree with you, and we've all done it. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, Cat 5 or Cat 6 are twisted pairs. It shouldn't be a problem, but uh, coaxial cable, avoid using them on any kind of coaxial cable that has a center conductor and a, shield of jack, a single shield jack, because the impedance of the cable will change when you tighten down that zip tie. Next question. Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas. How do you buy Ethernet and cable TV cable? I bury, I'm sorry, not buy, bury it underground. How deep, what spec, what tools could uh, would you use to buy yourself that don't cost a fortune? I have to admit, I've never done that. Never put cables down below. Um, so I, I do think that there's, I'm sure that there are a variety of um, regulations related to that. <laughs> so let's go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I did it once between the guest house and my main house, uh, but I opted not to direct bury it. I wasn't sure. I couldn't find the specs on the cable. So I actually ran a PVC conduit from the house to, to the second building and pulled it through there just thinking I'm going to give it a chance to last a generation, not run into something. Yeah, I mean, just remember that you really have to mark that. You have to mark it and, and it's a big deal to like when you put something underground, people will forget about it. And so being able to mark where that is, uh, having maps of what that looks like, those are things that, that, that fade away. And so it's really, really important. And what happens is someone's got a ditch witch or something and they hit it, you know, like, because they didn't, because they didn't know that it was there. A ditch, if you don't know what a ditch witch is, it's a, it's something to build these ditches really fast. It's thin, very cool, long, it's so cool. And so, I've, so while I, I have not run cables like that, I've seen other people do it. And it, it, you'd think, wow, I have to, it's going to take a long time to cut, cut a, cut a long trough for, for cabling. Turns out not so much. Uh, it's, it's, it's an it's like a chainsaw. We built a guest still. house. The yeah. coolest looking chainsaw. Took them 30 the minutes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> 70 feet. <laughs> ground saw. Yeah, go, go, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I had a problem with this running uh, control signals to sprinkler heads that are out in the field. Uh, sprink, uh, you know, man, I electrically controlled sprinkler manifolds and we would they would cut through the cables all the time uh because the gardener would go out there and, and try to dig up a weed or something and cut a cable uh so we eventually put them in conduits running conduits is probably the best way even if it's just pvc uh to keep uh you know things from cutting them or gophers from chewing on them things like that next question Orlando Augustine in Panama. Again, what's the best advice? Create your own SDI cables, buy them pre-built or get them made per request. I'm, a, you know, you can definitely, so it depends on, it depends. So for precision ones that are small, a lot of times 
we get we have them pre-built because if they're really thin and they're like little six inch ones that you're delivering for the camera making those is no fun and so either we have them made for us or we buy little short jumpers psc makes a lot of good ones that are that are very small and they're very thin and i don't want I don't want to make them. <laughs> so, so uh, the um, uh, for complex ones, uh, or or you know, if we're um, uh, if we're building it like a, a, a snake, oftentimes we have somebody else build those. Uh, we do build because we do so many SDIs. It's important that we have the capacity to build them ourselves, and so we build them uh, build them a lot. I will say that uh, I would save um, your hands and save your time and get if you're going to do your own. Um, I would highly recommend this is ca cable uh, coastal cable tools has this hand this hand uh, and you can it actually comes with a little power thing as well. Uh, it can go battery or power um, and with a little foot foot thing to run it if you want to. Um, but basically this is a this will strip your um, SDIs perfectly every single time. Um, and it also it's very fast, it's very accurate and you tell them what cables you have and they send you the you can actually swap out the um, uh, you can swap out the stripper so that it, it it works for the cable that you're using for that one, and it's 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 set up. It works, and the the whole like little um, little dumb thing, a little finger version of it that we see it on site every once in a while. I I, I and I admit I started with the, the motorized cable stripper, the coastal cable. So when I look at the little finger one, I'm just like, I mean, it's good to have in your bag, but it's a pain. Um, yeah, go ahead, uh, Courtney. Yeah, I've used for years, uh, because they're in town, uh, Pacific Radio has a, a division called No Shorts Cable Company, and they custom build uh, cables of all types of quality for SDI, for audio looms, et cetera, with whatever connectors you want on the ends of them and whatever length you want. You just uh, give them your specifications and they'll give you a quote. And their, their workmanship is very good. And I buy a lot of those short... You know, short, skinny, really flexible uh, SDI 12, uh, 12 gigahertz cables uh, that are great for doing patch patchwork. Uh, they make up a lot of them and sell a lot of pre-made ones. Plus, they will custom make cables for you. Uh, so check with Pacific Radio or No Shorts Cable Company. And and what I will say is also if you um, if you don't make them very often, get someone to make them for you. Like these are this is your show. So, um, you know, so if you're gonna, but, but, you know, so I, if, if you're not well practiced learning how to do it, and if you're gonna do them, if you've never done a certain kind of cable, um, you know, when I learned how to do the handheld, using this handheld device, I took like 15 of them. I just knew I was gonna blow through 15, you know, 15 ends and, you know, 20 feet of cable. And I just worked on it until I felt like I was comfortable with it. But I wouldn't just, um, it's, it's really important not to learn how to do it while you're building cables for your show signal. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. And if you have five or six pin Limo connectors or Fisher connectors, always have somebody else do it because you will hate yourself if you try. You'll hate Put yourself. Put a connector, a five life, conductor Limo that's a quarter inch across. Yeah, you're going to hate yourself for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Next question. David Brady, New York. Uh, with more with the move to USB-C, what about those legacy items that use Type-A, Type-B, Mini, Micro-B, Micro-B, SS, and so forth? Ad adapters or native cables? I found the latter at Cable Matters braided, too. Uh, go ahead, Jason. I got so sick of this, and it's an ongoing struggle. But uh, what I've settled on is standardized to Cat5, Cat6, and knock on wood, I've never had one of these guys fail. For for anything that's below USB-C, this should work pretty well. I try to keep, I try, I just have lots of different versions of those cables that are going from this to that and that to this and this to that. And um, and I I buy them as I need them. Um, I do the best I can not to have any more than I need to. <laughs> but you're right, it's, it's really a painful process. It does feel like USB-C is gonna stick around for a little while, so that's, uh, that's good um, in the sense that we have, and everything comes with them, I don't need any more. I've got like 50 of them here, so um, I, hopefully we'll be able to stick with this format for just a little while. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I buy about 10 or 20 at a time, uh, the USB, micro USB to USB-C and, and vice versa adapters and just carry them in all the pouches of all my bags so if the connector's wrong i have one, one that i can slip on there to convert it i do love the fact that you found braided ones though uh, next question douglas carmichael what's the best way to learn to make and or test your own cabling uh jason practice 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 or buy it yeah i mean the the 
there are some great videos on online um, that that will show you how to build both SDI and um, uh, XLR cables. Those are the two most common ones that we see people. I, I have to admit, I will not, Ethernet is so cheap and I hate making them so much that I will not make Ethernet cables. <laughs> like I just, I'm just like, I will buy them uh, yeah, I, or hire somebody who's willing to do that. I don't know why, but there's something about the way, the way they come out that just drives me crazy. Like it's not, it, you know, it just, it just, it makes me a little, and, um, and so, uh, but I, I find uh, XLR cables to be fun. I haven't done it in a long time. I, I came close to doing them for my, for my rig, but it was too fast. And I was just like, I haven't done these for a decade. So uh, I did love building XLR cables in the, in the, in the olden days, because it was just something I could listen to music and sit there. Same thing with SDI cables. The best thing in my opinion is that you get a long list of what you need and you get some good music and you just sit there and just get into a zone and start building these out. And it's, it's, it's actually a, a, a good afternoon. Go ahead, Courtney. And if you're going to be soldering connectors on, and I've done a lot of them, is get a temperature controlled soldering pencil that uh, controls the temperature dynamically all the time. You can get these relatively cheaply. You can get them that run on DC, and they even have uh, they have a temperature sensor in the tip, and um, you have a little readout here that uh, reads out the temperature. You set it to whatever temperature you want, and it maintains that temperature. The problem has is that when you're soldering like big XLR connectors, as soon as you touch the soldering iron to the solder cup, it drains all the heat out of the tip of the soldering iron, and then you got to hold it there for about a half an hour. But with these temperature control ones, they react very quickly, and they sense the temperature going down in the tip, and they raise the voltage and heat it back up again, and it maintains that temperature regardless of how much metal you're touching it to that's going to sink that temperature down. So find one that uh, is a fast-reacting temperature control soldering tip, and you will uh, be a lot happier, and it will make a lot better soldering joints. And uh, Mickey has said, we, we had gone back and forth because this one just came out. It's called a pine sole. Um, it's a smart mini portable soldering iron. And Mickey says he loves it. So we, we've gone back and forth. I was letting Mickey use it for a little while to make sure that it was going to, you know, that it, it was up to spec. And I think that now I'll buy one. It's only $27, I think. Next question. Ronnie Hossoy, Tromsø, Norway. How do you prevent loom mesh braid from unraveling if not using heat shrink? So usually a loom will unravel if it's got if it's got too much slack or too little. So if, if you've overstuffed it or understuffed it is when it starts to unravel. If you so you just know that that diameter of that loom is is specific, um, and you want to get the right one, but you shouldn't have that. And then otherwise, uh, we do occasionally when we know that that loom is going to stay the way it is, um, we'll wrap it with tape um, about every three feet or every meter or so. Um, just to make sure that it stays where, where we want it to stay. But that's, that's about the most we do with those. And the tape is usually just one thin wrap, one, uh, like a half inch wrap. It's just there to, we wanna make it easy for us to pop off if we wanna get back into it. Next question. Roscoe Jones, Madison, Indiana. Ping pong balls or Ziploc baggies on fish line? Fish tape, what tricks do you use to run wires through conduit? I'll go ahead, Jason. Um, my favorite trick is to try to avoid this and let an, let someone who really knows what they're doing do it. But um, if not, fish tape is is an excellent way to start, assuming you've got the room for it because you don't want to shred everything else. Um, also, you can go to a hardware store and get cable conduit lube. And um, it does exactly what it says it's going to do, and it's not going to degrade the sheath around the cables. Good, Bill. Generally speaking, the ping pong ball thing is to put a ping pong ball with a feeder thing and use a vacuum to suck it through so you've got one line run and you can pull that with your cable connections back. I used to use a lot of fish tape because I just, I, I, it's really easy to find at Home Depot. Plumbers have them up to a, like 100 feet and uh, it's a metal thing with a little hook on the end so you can pull a more robust group of cables through something using a fish tape that will sometimes break string. Next question. Eduardo Augustine in Panama. Where do you get those purple SDI cables? I'd like to get those. <laughs> Clark cable. Clark cable is where we buy the raw, and we buy them thousand a thousand feet at a time, typically. So you, you buy just rolls of of different colors that you have. So typically we have um, purple and red and gray are the ones that we have the most of. Um, oftentimes purple is going back into the system, red is going out of the system like a heart, and gray is kind of like, oh, we don't know what we're going to do with this yet, <laughs> but we've used other ones. Um, you do have to be careful. We have branding issues sometimes, so if we, you know, if we use, uh, if we go to a Verizon gig and we've got a bunch of uh, red, they'll think that 
it's T-Mobile and <laughs> so things like that. We had a bunch of yellow one, uh, yeah, a bunch of yellow SDI cables um, that uh, T-Mobile wouldn't let us use because it looked like Verizon. So it was. Uh, so you do have to think about those things as well. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, Canary makes uh, a wide variety of cables in both uh, you know audio and video cables in a variety of colors, uh, a rainbow of colors. So check out Canary. Next question. Ronnie Hoff, Soy Tromso, Norway. Long 100 foot, 30 meter braided fiber based USB C for Insta360 Link. Anyone got to test this and found a cable that works? Um, I think that these, I've had a lot of trouble with the Insta360 Link of anything that runs particularly long. It, it seems to be pretty quirky. Like it'll come on for a second and then come go right back off again. And so I, I don't think we found a solution for that yet. Sorry. Next question. Next one from Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana. What cables are you not willing to buy at the proper length? If any, what pre-built cable lengths frustrate you the most? Good, Bill. What frustrates me the most is you can find them in one meter, you can find them in three meter. It's harder and harder to find two meter cables, and sometimes you don't need that six foot almost long one, and it's just a little too short when you buy the one meter, so I wish there were more two meter options out there. You know, it's it's hard to get good ones that are particularly long as well, for, depending on the data cables. But that's the, you know, like whether it's USB or even HDMI, uh, getting long ones that are not super expensive are usually a challenge. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, RG6 cables, the 12K for running SDI, they're, you know, you can't, you can hardly bend them. They're very problematic for coiling and for, you know, running in, in and running out. I, I like to find these very narrow diameter, um, highly rated uh uh, SDI cables because a hundred foot hank of that cable is very small and you can fit it inside a bag easily and yet it can carry uh, a nice signal and I buy those uh, pre-made because getting the connectors on the end without them pulling off is a problem as well. So professionally made cables that use that smaller diameter um, RG59 cable is great. Next question. Ronnie Hofsoy, Tromso, Norway, building fiber trunk lines these days and looking at both Neutrik, Optical Con, and more DYI-inspired MTP24 from FS. The stuff from FS seems to be very flexible. Any thoughts? Here you go, Jason. Flexible fiber is an oxymoron. It, it Like, straight up. That's that's my feeling. Um, the more flexible it is, the the more people want to pull it or or move it through uh, studs, and then the more problematic that becomes. Yeah, I, the one thing I would I would say is when I start building these things, it depends on who you're answering to. So um, I don't do a lot of DIY stuff when I when I'm working with large corporations or large companies because if something goes wrong. Everything that you connected everything to, people are going to start asking about, okay, what was this connected to? And how was this done? And, was it, da, 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 da. and when you have anything that looks DIY, then you, it's, it's not, it doesn't put you under the, in the front of the bus, but it's one big step towards it. <laughs> so so I, I have a tendency to uh, be very defensive about what I build for kits. And so I would probably lean towards the Neutrik uh, Opticon just because I can defend it because it's a lot of, it's a, uh, is it, is it's used heavily in the industry. So you, I know that that, you know, if, you, if it's just you, you have to answer to, then I think the DIY thing might give you more flexibility and so on and so forth. But if you're going to do it for an external client, just know that if the, if the music stops when it wasn't supposed to, <laughs> you just want to make sure you're as far away from the front of the bus as possible. I think that was a good, uh, good day. It was a good day. So um, I, uh, you know, these, I, I've, I've ceased to try to figure this out that we do these, these shows and I go, we, we had a couple of things that we had planned for these days that didn't, you know, that had to get moved around a little bit. And so we put these, the iPhone one in iPhone one was like more live views than we've had in a long time. Concurrent, concurrent live views. Uh, I don't know what this one is yet. I haven't looked at it, but, but the, um, uh, and, uh, and I think that these things are, you know, we, we've proven that we can talk about cables with gaff tape for an hour. Um, and we had a lot of great questions. So great job by the producers for uh, asking all those great questions to kind of dr to, to drill this out of the system here. Thanks to the panelists. We can't do this without you. And thank you, thank you to the incredible team on the back end that is making this happen every single day. It's, it is a village that lights up every morning to make this happen, that, that, that are coding the back end that makes this work, that are managing and making sure everybody's ready to go, managing the questions and moving and cutting the show and all these other bits and pieces. Um, and we really appreciate everybody's contribution there. 
Uh, we traveled 128,000 miles today. That's uh, 207,000 kilometers. And that is 1.020 billion bananas for scale. All right, let's go ahead and jump into after hours. I'm surprised guy doesn't have a caliper on that. Banana caliper. <laughs> <laughs> Fresh poisonous too. <laughs> We're gonna have our Where's the thing. micrometer? So we have to build the what? What, what is the uh, imperial? Imperial. See, we have kind of the imperial banana there. So yeah, we, we could we could say Metric well, it, instead of like how many inches thick is something, we could say how many. How many bananas is that? That's like, 0. 0.75 metric bananas. <laughs> I was trying to see what they're. I'm very curious now with this because I, I looked over. I don't know why I looked at at, at the um, uh, at the stats on the last one, but I was like, I I opened it up yesterday and I was like, what happened? Like, how many people? <laughs> like, no one's that? ever covered the iPhone on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Maybe that was it. I don't know. It was. It was. A I very, was surprised at some of 